and a very warm welcome to everybody. I'm just waiting for another two minutes to see if a few more people will be joining. We uh, have many, many more people registered. So we'll just give two more minutes to see who joins. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining, I see. Of course, of course. Okay, so I think we can begin. Um, thank you all very much uh, for joining again this morning. We are very, very happy. We had an excellent session yesterday and many thanks to all the wonderful speakers. So, um, and we're looking forward very much to another very exciting uh, 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 session this morning. Uh, we are very delighted to have an excellent group of speakers uh, and case studies. So. Um, before I launch into a, a short recap, I just would like to play, if you'll allow me, a very short video on uh, uh, the, uh, the technical aspects. Um, Marion, please, could we? Yeah, thank you. I would like to also share that we have a, uh, we have interpretation in English, French and Arabic. Uh, please use the button below to select the language of your choice. Please go ahead with the video. Welcome to Living with Heritage webinar. To make the most of your experience, please listen carefully to the following instructions. So that we can easily identify you, please make sure your name is entered in the following format. Country or institution, name, surname. To change it, first leave the webinar, then on the mobile app, go to settings, my profile, and then display name. You can change your name via the Zoom website by entering your account, selecting Edit, then Display Name. If you are a non-registered user, just re-enter with a new name. To help you follow the webinar, we offer live interpretation in three languages. Click on the interpretation icon, then select your preferred language. To use this feature, please re-enter the webinar and download the latest version of Zoom. Attendees follow the webinar as silent observers. However, there will be time for questions. 
At any time during the talk, click on the chat icon and a window will open where you can type in your question. It will be answered during the discussion session. You can also interact with the speakers vocally during the discussion session. To do so, click on the raise hand icon. The moderator will be notified that you have a question or comment. When you're called on by name, a window will open asking you to unmute your microphone. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you very much. Um, now, I just want to give a very quick recap on some of the key points that emerged yesterday. Um, first of all, the need to develop an interdisciplinary and integrated approach uh, to, uh, to, to adaptive reuse and regeneration. Um, all of the, the key points, the key speakers, as well as uh, the discussion uh, indicated the importance of uh, uh, adaptive reuse and regeneration. Uh, there was a clear, uh, clear uh, understanding that the Euro-Mediterranean region, uh, you know, this was something that was very important. The pressures on urbanization was recognized. Um, uh, many of the case studies focused on different aspects and fields that concern heritage preservation and regeneration projects. A second point that emerged had to do with um, seeing heritage as a catalyst for sustainable local development. So there was a great deal of emphasis on connecting ideas of sustainable development uh, to uh, local uh, and local community development, so that it was not about economic growth alone, but rather about sustainable development and that the interventions need to go beyond physical interventions. Um, an aspect, uh, so as, as also related to this was a great deal of emphasis on inclusion and affordability, so that all different uh, sections and different groups of people uh, were included uh, in the processes, there was consultation and engagement, as well as the beneficiaries, so that the benefits of regeneration and adaptive reuse uh, were available to a larger, wider group of people. There was also, uh, uh, given the current situation of the ongoing pandemic, uh, putting the focus back on local communities uh, and also looking at digital technologies, given the lack of tourism, uh, but most significantly looking at livability of, of spaces uh, for local communities uh, was given very high priority, looking at the circular aspect of the economy, circular economy and looking at zero waste and carbon minimal um, and reducing the carbon footprint uh, overall, having uh, uh, a, a diminishing emissions was, was a major part of it. So the connections to uh, climate change and looking at a circular economy was a very significant point that, was, that came through again and again. Um, also, the importance of uh, public spaces and urban infrastructure, that it was not just about buildings and uh, also about uh, looking at uh, innovative uh, and creative solutions uh, in the framework of the OUV. So once you, uh, you know, the OUV is uh, especially for World Heritage, we're looking at the outstanding universal value is clearly outlined, then uh, the major solid uh, conservation plans with innovation and creativity can be, uh, can be seen and certain aspects could have more innovative solutions as long as it is uh, either compatible with or not having an impact on the OUV. Uh, and finally, uh, all of it pointed to a great deal, uh, uh, the great need for very detailed assessment to know exactly what within the historic city needs to be retained and what can be modified, because obviously nobody's expecting that an entire physical fabric of the city remains untouched. Um, but the question is, how does one decide what changes and to what extent can it be changed and in what way does that change? So we're hoping that today's presentations will shed more light and help us refine these points uh, further. 
So without um, uh, further further delay, I'd like to uh, uh, call on uh, Ms. Karin Hans from uh, the International Federation of Landscape Architects, uh, the IFLA World in Europe, uh, the president of the Europe region. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. And you will be talking about nature cultural linkages. A very warm welcome to you, uh, Karin. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Um... May I have access? Mm -hmm. Technicians, please. Thank you. Yes, good morning. Thank you so much. And thank you for um, summing up uh, from, to, from yesterday. I think that we landscape architects are fully in line with all what have been mentioned in your summary, uh, Doctor. Uh, we have been asked to look at the, this topic on nature culture uh, linkage and through a landscape understanding of, uh, um, of our historical sites and how this can be adapted and reused for uh, sustainable cities. Um, myself. Oh. Yes. <laughs> uh, Seems that I have a little problem. Uh, excuse me, seems that I have a problem to. <clears throat> okay, I want to just remember who is the International Federation of Landscape Architects, IFLA. It is an organization who was created after World War. It was Second World War. And it was in, indeed to answer to the urges who was after World, World War II on uh, rural and urban tissues and how to uh, guarantee a better living for people. This uh, profession of landscape architecture was recognized by the United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization in 1965. And since has been by UNESCO, recognize the, the IFLA as a non-governmental organization. Today, IFLA World uh, is represented in all continents and represents 77 countries. In the region Europe, we have about 20,000 landscape architects in this association representing 34 countries out of Council of Europe scale. Today, when we see the world heritage is about the linkage between nature and culture, for us, this is obviously a grounding element and how to do so that this is not two different notion, but it goes under one uh, international uh, uh, instrument. And we think that through a landscape understanding of a place, we can build that uh, interlinkage between nature and culture. Um, we think that uh, divided has been done too, doing too long. And uh, indeed, as you mentioned yesterday, more have shown that the interrelation is through multiple or pluridisciplinary teams and take time to understand this nature culture uh, uh, concept. We have examples through a practice-based research proposal on how we can do. It is this integrative research and practice who has helped us to find the mode and rethink the nature culture heritage uh, relationship so that we can have pluridisciplinary teams uh, with the municipalities and locals. We are working for the locals. So how to co-design with them it is not always so easy. We are still the specialists, but we have to share. We have to be the enabler or, as somebody said, the facilitator. We like one policy who's uh, very uh, unused in the Netherlands called preservation through development as a mode of doing. Just to let you know who I am, I'm a landscape architect who worked already back in the 80s in the rural at the time when very little people worked on rural sites where there is also historical sites. At the time, and then uh, back at uh, that time, I worked, for instance, for a ruin of a medieval time in northern uh, France. And this area was um, completely left over. 
working with the local the locals and the local farmer on which type of management could be adapted to this site has orientated the design, meaning that it is quite simple, maintained by a, 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 a tractor so that uh, what is in the fields nearby can be also in the uh, surrounding of this uh, room. It gave an overall pedestal for the room. It gave highlighted the site again and the understanding of its relationship to the large geography site. Overall, it was named Folville, the villa in the, uh, in the leaves. Therefore, some more plants were proposed around this areas. So with three years a square meter, we can reveal and find again our heritage and uh, be in line with the geography and the history of, of a site. I would like to um, in deeper case studies in Girona, in the Mediterranean, done by the office uh, uh, Marty Franche, the office EMF. We all know this uh, historical uh, city for its Jewish uh, quarter, for its, uh, all the buildings along the river, for its uh, amazing um, uh, uh, walls around the, the city and the different uh, cathedrals. This site is hugely uh, used by uh, tourists uh, during years. But what happened this year? Due to the corona time, suddenly there was a new use. Not only the few public parks in the center, people needed more space, new type of public spaces during this corona period. So the work has been of our uh, has been to, from Marty Franch, who started that already some years ago, but now it was the, the highlighted his work during this pandemic uh, period for the locals, not only the tourists. It was the increase of paths who linked the natural fitting of uh, Girona, an understanding of the long-standing cultural connection between the historical site and the physical of it. This means, why is it so important to understand the topography and the biodiversity of this site linked to the historical city has been one of the learnings from this uh, event. Overall, he says also that the city has grown. There's a map of the city of Girona, but today the map has increased. It is as if the city has been gr growing bigger because he has linked all the all leftover areas who are left over out the outcrit of the town to become the new public space of the area. It means also to, that we understand better how the city fit with the natural setting. So more spaces uh, on the former neglected area, a potential for biodiversity. The method has been this geohistory understanding a wording uh, that we use from the historical professor uh, Brodella. The management of the local has been important. Low management because there's not more money, but how do we can do easy things with low management and uh, lack of uh, cost of money, we can do a lot by using also the locals, it's for them. We can see that in general, if the municipalities are willing to do a little management that the designer gives the overall uh, facilitator uh, to design and guide, then the locals can be the activators. That is what is the learning from the Rona project. And we have seen this uh, as something that can be transferred to many of our other Mediterranean historical cities uh, around uh, the basin. So an evolutive process enriched the past and the town of the historic and patrimonial town of Girona for a better uh, connection between nature and culture through this jury history understanding. So the city is do not stop just at its historical walls, much more it goes over to the shore of the, uh, 
the overall landscape. We like from the designers how they think about how you can test, how you can make prototype and test. Girona for sure has been done through the initiative of one person through his research and practice-based research, testing and showing that it can be taken over from the, to the locals to maintain it, but also make it livable. Uh, for most landscape architects, this geohistory uh, way of doing is a way to already start and understand the already there, the visible and the invisible of the landscape and open the first ideas. If I take the ideas of Thomas Siviets who alert us that in historical cities or in any type of cities, there is, we should, uh, Earth link again our cities to the nature, to the local. This is mainly an urge when we think about the water manage, there's a bigger and bigger problem. We have droughts, we have floods. And as he said, I see in cities and urban landscapes today, sometimes are hit by torrential rain and destructive body of water. So rethink the cities with the nature with this context can be one way of answer to this urge linked to climate change. We have at IFLA Europe a group called Mednet is just starting a small group who try to learn from each other on this topic on citizen nature. So in 2019 before the pandemic they talked about the floodplain problems they united their ideas and had cross-cultural learnings. We think that this mednet could be an answer to learn from each other and make this collective grow within IFLA Europe and over all the Mediterranean, not just one coast, all shore of it. The example from France was on Jerry history, on Egmont, a, a medieval city, where it found again is geography, the sense of the place. Before there were parking areas, bus areas, we didn't understand any longer why this town had this big walls and why it was situated here. Thanks to a geology understanding of the past and redo through a design management and planning process, it has found again the idea and the sense of the place. This means the relationship between nature and culture. We would like to thank you for all the recommendation that you have given us uh, in 2013 and 2019 to go through and go to over to this type of uh, uh, mode of doing uh, and have a shift on the concept and practice of management. And we think that this geohistory understanding of a place can be an answer. We have shown here today just some examples. Um, the preservation through development pro, uh, policy of the Dutch is something that we, or at least some of us use as a way of answer. We can preserve more if we find good development projects in line with the urges of today in a pluridisciplinary uh, teams. We'd like to thank you very much for the invitation and highlight that we are going to be in October in uh, uh, Granada, go on with the same topic as yours and hope that you will take part in the landscape here and now in Spain um, in an other very important historical city for all our for all of us for our humanity is fully in line with the, the connection to its nature. I would like to thank you again for the invitation and open for questions and answers. Yes. Thank you very much, um, Karen, for that really, really important uh, presentation and for raising uh, these uh, points around uh, uh, 
nature cultural linkages uh, and preservation through development. Uh, I will request all the speakers to please hang on to your questions, note them down. We will bring up all the questions at the end uh, for discussion um, after all the presentations. As it's a very short session, this will be the most effective. So if you will allow me, I would like to now uh, invite uh, Mr. Thomas Vounier, President of the International Union of Architects. It's such a great pleasure to have you with us. And of course, when we talk about adaptive reuse and regeneration, the most important element here is good design, because good design can help make or break uh, the intervention uh, in a historic city. It can be compatible or completely take away from the heritage values. So we're waiting to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, and hello to all of you. Uh, you know, the International Union of Architects, which is 72 years old this year, uh, shares its DNA with UNESCO, with the United Nations itself. Now I understand with IFLA and many other organizations that developed in the wake of one of the most destructive world wars uh, ever. And uh, our first president, a man named Auguste Perret, uh, an architect from France, believed uh, then, as we do now, that architecture has the power to make great good in society. He uh, and his brother, as may be known to some of you, were instrumental in restoring Le Havre, today a, a world heritage city, uh, and to introduce elements of sunlight and air and modernism to a city that had been devastated by Allied bombing uh, in the modern era. Uh, we are uh, long associated with UNESCO, back to 1956, in fact, and uh, we, we share with them a charter on architectural education, but we also uh, inherited from UNESCO the responsibility to organize world design competitions, which produced the Sydney Opera House, the Centre Pompidou, and a number of other great buildings that I'm sure are known to many of you. We're proud to be associated with uh, UNESCO World Heritage Center and with the Union for the Mediterranean. We support the aims of the 2011 UNESCO recommendations on historic urban landscape and certainly the goals of the action plans uh, for cities and for housing uh, of the Union for the Mediterranean. UNESCO uh, has identified the issue at hand in this way, and I'm going to quote, rapid and unplanned development in major urban areas, coupled with the onset of climate change, has caused a fast decline of many historical city centers, raising concerns on the state of conservation of the world heritage properties, endangering cultural heritage, urban landscapes, and the unique identity of the Mediterranean region. Well, the Mediterranean seacoast may have a concentration of world heritage properties uh, in greater uh, magnitude than other places in the world, and it may face greater pressures from in-migration than many other parts of the world. But the threats to heritage in the Mediterranean cities are not much different from those facing many cities of the world, and especially those in Europe. I'll return to this in my closing remarks. Tourism has been a large element of the challenges facing the Mediterranean. We do not yet know for how long or to what extent this pandemic is going to decrease the pressures of mass tourism. We don't know when or in what manner uh, the mass tour tourism industry will seek to resume operations when this pandemic recedes, but it is unlikely that anytime soon we will see numbers of tourists, especially from East Asia and the Indian subcontinent, in anything like the numbers uh, we have seen just a little more than a year ago. So tourism from all other parts of the world is also down, as near to zero as we've ever seen. And so to some degree, I suppose it could be said that pressures have diminished if mass tourism has driven undesirable development and thus endangered the Mediterranean, that threat may be reduced for a time, but it will probably be back. And we know that it can have pernicious influences on heritage. 
That is why we have joined with UNESCO and with others to explore more responsible approaches to tourism, including design guidelines and criteria that could apply to World Heritage sites, cities, and properties. As tourism has subsided, so have the revenues earned from tourism and these revenues that support heritage programs and projects. The deficit is also being felt and already having impact in many places. As I said at the outset, Mediterranean cities face the same issues of many other cities of the world, perhaps in larger measure, but certainly similar in kind. Cities everywhere face pressure from organic growth. That is just increased demand for land, for facilities, for housing, for roads, for rail networks and all the rest, driven purely by growing populations. Many people have a vested interest in growth and development, entrepreneurs, promoters, developers, politicians, builders, investors, business owners, and yes, architects, and more. The Mediterranean is not alone in facing these demands and challenges of the unregulated growth. Paris, London, Prague, Mumbai, here, Nairobi, Kenya, all of them face, to put back in quotes what was taken from the program materials, rapid and unplanned development. So all cities need guidelines and principles by which they can grow and, and develop responsibly. I'm sure you're all familiar with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals promulgated by UN Habitat. And our commission, the UIA Commission on Sustainable Development, has produced an architecture guide that shows how design, urban design, architecture can address every single one of the 17 development, sustainable development goals. I commend this guideline to you. It shows examples of projects and urban plans from all over the world uh, and in many different geographic, economic, ethnic, and cultural contexts. Can solutions that uh, and ideas developed for the Mediterranean find applications elsewhere? We think so. Can ideas and solutions developed elsewhere find application in the Mediterranean? We also think so. Thank you for including us in your work and please be in touch, here's how, whenever you think that we might have common interests and approaches. Thank you again for including us in this program. I look forward to hearing the case studies that will follow. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vonnier. This was uh, really uh, very helpful to, to hear uh, your endorsement of uh, the, uh, the 2011 uh, recommendation and the importance of uh, design and to look at uh, the idea of designing responsibly uh, for uh, for all cities uh, and integrating sustainable development. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you again and I would like now to move directly to uh, uh, to our first case study for this morning, uh, which is uh, which is in Malaysia in Georgetown in Malaysia and we are delighted to have with us today. Mr. Hamdan Majid, Executive Director of Think City Malaysia. Um, I know that Georgetown has been doing uh, a lot of active work for a number of years now, and we look forward to hearing from you about this effort. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you, Jyoti, for inviting us to join I'm, this. I'm sorry, I think we had the wrong, yes. I think we had the wrong PPT on the screen, but please go ahead. Yeah, should I share it directly from my, from my end? I think that it should be fine now. Please okay. go ahead. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, th thank you very much for inviting us to join this uh, wonderful gathering of uh, people who are concerned about how do you retain and, and preserve uh, part of our historical uh, urban landscapes that hopefully that we can retain and share with the future. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that we are able to come and share with you the experience in Georgetown. But uh, as, I thought as we start this presentation, let me just quickly go through uh, uh, a quick introduction to Think City. Think City is a wholly owned subsidiary. It's an uh, arm of Kazana National. Kazana National is the investment arm of the government of Malaysia. 
we were established as an impact focused organization that focuses on making cities more livable. Uh, we make people people friendly cities and, and resilient and maybe a catalyst for change in the way some cities are planned, organized, and so on. Uh, the four areas of work that we try to use as a basis to uh, shape uh, our interventions, uh, where it focuses on place making, resilience, analytics, and there's a deep focus in terms of how we try to actually use historic urban landscapes as an asset in terms of shaping a lot of our regeneration and, re and uh, redevelopment programs uh, across the country in Malaysia. Uh, one of the key areas, aside from the fact that, that we, we, we also firmly believe there's a need to systematically build capacity, and in this regard, we also established Think City Institute to support a program of uh, building capacity uh, of both uh, current practitioners and future experts in this area of uh, uh, building, what you call building a community of, of experts that will support the process of uh, regeneration and redevelopment. <laughs> So we started in Georgetown uh, in 2009, it's slightly over 12 years now. Um, and uh, our journey now has enabled us to expand to different parts of Malaysia. Um, and we are in the process now expanding our footprint. And principally our focus has been about how do you revive and renew existing urban centers uh, that already exist, where there, and a lot of these urban centers have got historical legacies that can be unlocked. And we have focused our efforts in all of these different, different cities that we have that you see in the screen in terms of how it can be used as an asset to re renew and reposition. Let me start with a case study. Um, maybe this is just to highlight to say over the last 10 years, uh, we have done more than seven, uh, nearly what do you call 750 projects uh, with an economic value of a billion ringgits. Uh, and, and, and it has created a systematic impact in the cities in Malaysia. Now, Georgetown, as you know, uh, uh, was a port city that was established way back in 1786, and uh, its main purpose was actually to serve uh, British uh, or, for, or British interests in in Southeast Asia, and and to be a hub for its uh, gateway into Southeast Asia. And it had grown over time, and uh, at the images at the background shows the kind of uh, place that Georgetown, how Georgetown has uh, started off as a port city, but and and as a result of being a port city, it also attracted what do you call uh, diverse communities to locate and operate. So uh, Georgetown became the kind of cultural hub in Southeast Asia that brought people around uh, from China, India, and the Southeast Asian region. And it became a huge melting pot of, uh, of, of both people, communities, and, 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 and reflected in, in the material culture. Now, architecture and urban landscapes adopted largely they, the, what you call, you can see this image was that it reflected a particular time period. And, and this was one of the assets of why Georgetown was listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But however, with the loss of the free port status in the 60s uh, and the booming of many, uh, many, uh, manufacturing uh, and free trade zones, in, this resulted in the city falling into decay and neglect. In fact, to a large extent, I think uh, it, 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 stood, it stood still in time. However, this was a great blessing, uh, and this en enabled us to what do you call uh, preserve and uh, uh, rebuild uh, uh, the, the 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 Georgetown. Georgetown was inscribed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in two thousand eight. But prior to the listing, these were the kind of issues that we faced, like many cities that we heard in yesterday's presentation, uh, underutilized heritage asset, uh, and they are disconnected from its urban fabric. You know, um, uh, many of the uh, public realm were not well managed. Um, at, historical assets were not uh, well thought through. Some were in total state of disrepair, uh, flooding, and also a general a general state of decay. So the UNESCO inscription was a blessing in disguise, as I said earlier, that they created an impetus for Penang to take uh, to to take the bull by its horn. I would say that to say that how. Culture became a big driver to renew and reposition Penang's uh, tourism sector. In fact, I would probably would, you would even say that the, the Penang would be probably a, a case study reflection how investing in culture has made Penang to become or Georgetown to become a new cultural icon in Southeast Asia. So these are the three reasons why I think uh, uh, UNESCO had listed. One was its historic port town together with Malacca. Two was multiculturalism, and three was its architecture. Um, but as we started this journey, uh, it was a low base where we did not have the 
expertise, experience of managing World Heritage Site. So part of the process and journey had been was to reach out to different multiple different partners. Uh, here's an image of one of those which was work our, our collaboration with the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. But this was not limited to one, but rather we explored working with expertise from different parts of the world. Because when we started the journey, the experience that we had in Penang was very limited and there was a need to build capacity to understand how do you manage and renew a uh, historic site uh, in, you know, given the fact that you know, uh, most of these assets, uh, there was little knowledge or even uh, experience in terms of how these spaces can be managed. So the approach, I think, was very, very systematic. We took a very systematic approach in terms of how we go about doing this. We started with a, a data collection, a proper baseline exception, and also a, a, a full-scale dilapidation study of the city and its building and its assets. From there, a con a concept and strategies were put in place Conservation plans were drawn up, management plans were, 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 were organized, um, and, and we had to also go through a whole process of demonstrating it, where there were, were a lot of pilots, uh, uh, mock-ups, material experimentations, and so on. And, and we also had to build capacity uh, and knowledge transfer and documentation. So these are some examples of the process of how what we have done you know, from strategic master plans management plans, public ground improvement, conservation, and partnerships. Um, these are some of the zones that we identified for invention using the, the planning as an approach, where we looked at how do you reposition and renew the historic core of Georgetown. Um, so as you know that, uh, the, the, that part of the inscription enabled us to put together a special area plan so that they had a legal status in terms of how the site will be governed. But further to that, we also put together a strategic master plan and a planning and design guideline for public realm improvement. And we also had to actually draw up uh, conservation management plans uh, and set the new benchmark and standards in terms of how sites can be conserved, particularly category one sites uh, and monuments in the city. Aside from that, uh, for those who are in category two, category three, we also you know, encourage uh, site owners to develop heritage management plans and the rehabilitation report as a basis towards renewing and, and, and regenerating sites that are, are, are culturally important. Um, this is an example of a public ground improvement project and uh, what was a site that had declined and uh, what was, you know, uh, was an important historical site uh, eventually had declined to become a illegal flea market. In fact, uh, as a result of this, in fact, the, it, it resulted in the whole neighborhood being hollowed out. But through a process of renewing and reposition, we worked with the communities and the businesses and so on to see how the site can be repositioned and, and, and we reintroduced the idea of a garden, uh, of, a, of a park. And, and we also then brought back a life uh, into an area that was totally in, in decline. Uh, this is another example of a public ground improvement. Uh, again, with, uh, we approached it whereby, what do you call, in terms of introducing uh, uh, new walkways uh, and, and set the new standards in terms of how to actually uh, unlock the value of historical assets and so on of these sites. Uh, this was what it was before the upgrading, uh, and this is a kind of change. As a result of the change that I showed earlier, that you know people are starting to use the place in different ways. So these are some of the images of the transformation that has taken place. Again. We also had to actually use a lot of uh, uh, historical images and evidence as we went through the different parts of the city, uh, particularly in terms of uh, renewing uh, what I would call uh, significant sites in the city, because you know we do not have the original building plans nor the uh, evidence uh, nor the the what do you call uh, uh, drawings of this part, of part many parts of the city, so we used a lot of, of photo evidence that were available or from the archives. And we, would, we looked at how can we reconstruct back the old uh, in a manner that will fit with the re regeneration program that we had embarked on. So these are some of the schematics of uh, the changes that were introduced in the city. Uh, this, was some, this was some of the, the sites that looked before and after changes. Again, this is an image of the site. So, so that we wanted to bring back the historical elements so that it will improve and enhance the uh, historic urban landscapes uh, that were that were needed to be done. And this is just images to just to share with you the, the kind of transformation that has happened. So part of the program 
most resulted in terms of new material development and, and pioneering new ways in terms of intervention. In fact, uh, given the city is constrained in public spaces, we also used some of the what you call a, um, uh, adaptive use of uh, an example would be the laneways. The laneways in Georgetown were used as night soil collection points. But given that with modern sewerage, these night soil collection points uh, were still in, in, you know, with, with the state of disuse. So we, 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 we participated in a manner where that really called, we uh, worked with the city government and we, we pioneered a way to show that how laneways can be upgraded and made to become also additional public spaces that could be used. So new materials were developed in terms of how this could be done and how new approaches, how uh, this has been actually have been implemented. Uh, parts of the public realm improvement also had been the re reconstruction of the seawall uh, that involved complex engineering and also how do you rebuild a historical wall using new techniques but in compliance with the uh, uh, with the standards that is set by the regulatory authorities to comply with the this thing as a site, uh, historic site. So these are some of the uh, kind of conservation works that has been done to, to sites where we have been restoring uh, the old forts, uh, the moat, a reintroduction of the moat back into the city, um, uh, rehabilitation of uh, um, monuments and historical uh, mansions that were in the city. So this had to go through a whole process of uh, uh, renew, you know, you had to go back to the basics uh, we had to go back to, you know, because most of the traits were not available or most of the skill sets were not available. So we had to bring in expertise where needed. But we also used local expertise uh, in terms of uh, producing a lot of it locally. In fact, to a large extent, I probably will say that 90-95% uh, of all materials and skills that were needed in doing this were actually sourced locally um, and, and, and produced locally. Um, and we wanted also, as we did this work, that you know, we didn't want to contribute to the issue of carbon footprint as we, you know, particularly this is a big issue in, here in Malaysia. So these are some of the changes of the sites that have been transformed. This was uh, the, 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 the call, uh, restoration of the fountain garden. This was uh, one of the first garden restoration projects that was carried out in Malaysia. Uh, they went back to look at the, the historical layout of the, uh, this particular play, uh, location uh, and uh, of a full completed uh, restoration of the site. These are some of the images of the changes that has happened. Now, as we went through the process of, uh, particularly in the fort and, uh, and the moat, there was extensive need to actually go back to, uh, because we did not have any particular plans and these sites have gone through rapid changes over the last 200 over years. Um, in fact, you know, we started with a lot of uh, what you call a discount, process of discovering. So archeological works were carried out uh, before any form of restoration works were, were started. Uh, we had to actually dig uh, uh, and, and identify the, the foundations that were totally, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, disappeared as a result of uh, a rapid change in the city. Um, and there was a need to redevelop new materials uh, and obviously undo a lot of the past uh, conservation works that were not done for, uh, appropriately to the standards that were required. So these are some of the, the images of the conservation, ongoing conservation works. Uh, more reinstatement and also how we are exploring the cura uh, curation of new content in terms of how the sites could be possibly used. Um, this is what it looked like before we started. This is what it is now as the ongoing and the current storerooms. Uh, and this is the current most recent image of the site that we, that we have been restored and we have been actually been working towards restoring and rehabilitating. Um, this was some of the images of uh, what it was, uh, you know, prior to listing as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This is what we are now doing, where we are actually in the whole process of, uh, uh, after, this is after the archaeological ex excavation, that we are, we are working towards restoring the moat and the, the uh, rehab, uh, conserving the historical buildings that are on site. And these are some of the images for what it could possibly look like in the future. Uh, as we complete the project. And we envisage this to be completed over the next course of the next two years. Um, so these are some of the things that we have realized that as we, as, as we carried out, there was a need to adopt to uh, what I call the best in class standards. And this is what we're trying to showcase in the conservation of the fort. Uh, and as I highlighted earlier, there was the setting the new benchmark to restore historic gardens uh, and also restoring mansions and so on. Now this effort, to renew was not only done led by the public, what you call the public sector, but rather well, there was extensive partnership with the private sector. 
we started off with the collaboration with the private sector in 2009 through by awarding uh, what we call catalytic grants. Uh, and, uh, and as a result of that, many hundreds of sites in the city or shop houses have been restored and, and, that, and, 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 and given, breathed new lives and, and, and in fact, through new users. So these are some of the images of how what do you call the transformation has been brought about into the sites. Um, just to say that, you know, the private sector has been an active partner who have played uh, what I would call a leading role uh, with the government now, now coming forth to, to support the efforts of the private sector to, 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 to be a catalyst towards uh, transforming Georgetown as a world heritage site. Um, aside from the fact that there are physical changes, there's been extensive work in terms of the, what they call, uh, 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 what you, uh, the intangible heritage uh, content curation and also programming and, and place management of the site. Uh, this has been an ongoing work uh, and this that we are trying to ensure that what they call this, the activities cut across uh, different ages and groups uh, and varied types of programs and activities has been, uh, has been integral to, this, uh, to the success that has been seen in Georgetown over the last decade. Um, and so this has been uh, what they call, uh, uh, so this is just highlighting some of the approaches that we've taken in terms of how we had actually worked in different partners and plans and so on. But I thought I will end my presentation here um, with a few points for reflection because we have seen the current COVID crisis actually has, has resulted in, uh, while we, you know, this is just a, uh, we, we just completed recently a land use study uh, uh, a full census that uh, so that we have seen the kind of transformation that has happened in the city. So it's been positive and negative whereby you know we have seen a de continued decline in terms of residential population, while while we have seen newer users of the city, uh, and there were, has been a, a bigger in, uh, amount of properties that have been invested and brought back to life. So it's it's been a positive and negative, but a lot of these changes now are are, are reversing as a result of the COVID crisis. As it has been said earlier, that the tourism sector was greatly impacted as a result, you know, of this of this uh, decline of travel, and uh, and probably you know uh, by the time travel comes back uh, in 2023 in a bigger way, uh, what would be the kind of impact, and whether a lot of these buildings and, and properties that have been restored, uh, will they be able to sustain uh, and uh, and right the down cycle that has been seen? So this has created a sort of like what we see that. Pre-COVID, we saw that a lot of mass tourism has led, led by cheap flights, and they were pretty much thought stays. Uh, and you know, it was very much driven by the idea of uh, Instagrammable scenery, mass, and focus on tourism production. But post-COVID, we think there's going to be a rise of travel bubbles, and then people are going to take quite considerate amount of time through quarantines and safety consideration. Thus, it's going to result in longer stays, and people are going to uh, there's going to demand high value. Uh, immersive experience and um, there's going to be a greater need for what do you call uh, uh, focus on citizen amenities that will also attract visitors. So I think those are going to be the kind of interventions that we see that, that, that maybe there's going to be a need for us to rethink as we go through this journey. And, my, and, and part of the strategy that we're doing in Georgetown is that going forward, we're looking at how can we extract more out of the, uh, the state's uh, existing urban core and number two, we are, we are working to invest in greater amount in terms of the cultural asset and improving livability in the city. And three is that we think there's a need to build resilience so that it doesn't not only, what do you call the historic areas are dependent on the tourism sector, but we need to diversify and look at new innovative sectors uh, as also as the users of the city, because depending on tourism alone means that, that whatever changes that has happened could be reversed, but then we need something that's more sustaining and there's a need to rethink about it. What will make? Uh, what will ensure that uh, that uh, this is the city? So, uh, the five key lessons that, if I can conclude, is that you know there's a need to consolidate a comprehensive and holistic plan for the area, and this should be based on an accurate understanding of the historic evolution of the area and its and its previous configuration through old plans, historic photographs, and visual representation. So, there's a lot of evidence-based work that had to be done. Number two is that we we did we will learn that we cannot proceed haphazardly through separate and unrelated interventions. Rather, there was a need to ensure that 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 uh, how do you ensure the different people, actors and people, both from the public and private sector, are coordinated and implementation is is executed in a very uh, uh, um, what do you call a comprehensive approach. 
is that you know there's a great I, need for partnership, public consultation, and community engagement. And 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 if I can conclude, uh, that, that what do you call, uh, that that some lessons that we learned that, that you know there are going to be things that we are going to struggle to re, uh, to what you call uh, retain and 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 uh, uh, and rehabilitate, and and probably we need to also have plans about what do we do with them. That uh, in the sense that you know as a result of uh, the changes that's happening uh, due to what do you call uh, over tourism and so on. How do you manage in that, but particularly in tangible heritage? With that, thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hamdan Majid. This was really uh, very rich. Uh, lots of different uh, uh, efforts that you have made. And we have lots of questions uh, to, to understand what you're doing better. But for the moment, we'd like to move forward and uh, directly uh, turn it over to Mr. Uh, Philippe Lamy. We are delighted to have you with us uh, from the historic city of Lyon uh, to talk about the case study of the World Heritage Site of Lyon in France, uh, Plan Local uh, d'Andonisme de la Métropole de Lyon, Patrimoine, Urbain et Paysage. Mr. Philippe Lamy, coordinator uh, uh, of the uh, and in charge of the site of the historic site of Lyon. Monsieur Lyon, uh, Monsieur Lamy. Uh, bonjour, je vous remercie. Euh, donc la, la ville de Lyon est très honorée d'être sollicitée par l'Union pour la Méditerranée et le Centre du Patrimoine Mondial de l'UNESCO pour participer à ce World Heritage City Lab sur la réutilisation, l'adaptation et la régénération des sites du patrimoine mondial dans la région euro-méditerranée. Elle remercie chaleureusement les organisateurs de cette conférence et de cette invitation. Je suis architecte urbaniste, euh, coordinateur urbain de la ville, en charge de l'hypercentre de Lyon et du périmètre UNESCO, et représente M. Sylvain Godineau, adjoint au maire, en charge de la transition écologique et des patrimoines, qui me charge de vous transmettre ses félicitations pour ce City Lab. Je vais essayer de partager ma présentation. La voici. Je pense que vous, là, tout le monde la voit. Donc, j'ai présenté la ville en quelques mots. Donc, Lyon est une ville de 520 000 habitants sur une superficie de 48 km carrés environ au cœur d'une métropole de 1 400 000 habitants sur une superficie de 534 km. Son centre historique a été inscrit sur la liste du patrimoine mondial en 1998. Le périmètre d'une superficie de 423 hectares correspond à la ville fondée en moins 43 avant Jésus-Christ par le proconsul romain Munatius Plancus. La ville lyonnaise est restée concentrée dans ce périmètre jusqu'à la fin du XVIIIe siècle avant de s'étendre de façon continue à l'extérieur de son enceinte initiale. L'UNESCO inscrit Lyon au titre notamment du critère 4, en reconnaissant que de par la manière particulière dont elle s'est structurée dans l'espace, Lyon illustre de façon exceptionnelle les progrès et l'évolution de la conception architecturale et de l'urbanisme au fil des siècles. Le site conserve une forte authenticité avec des édifices emblématiques, mais également des tissus urbains de chacune des périodes de développement de la cité. Vous voyez sur les plans là, des plans de datation en faits à la fois des, des immeubles et puis des espaces publics. Lyon s'est développé à partir du modèle de l'immeuble à loyer, générant une forte densité avec des contraintes architecturales déclinées dans une infinité de formes. On recense plus de 5000 immeubles qui constituent la chair de la ville. Celle-ci présente aujourd'hui une mosaïque harmonieuse de quartiers de la Renaissance au XIXe siècle, intégrant d'importants vestiges romains et édifices du Moyen Âge. Le centre historique demeure par ailleurs le cœur vivant et dynamique de la métropole, en accueillant des activités économiques, des services publics majeurs et une population résidente dense. Situé, situé à la confluence d'un fleuve et d'une rivière importante, Surplombé par deux collines, le site historique de Lyon présente une morphologie particulière qui participe fortement à l'identité et à la qualité de son territoire. Celui-ci correspond également à un point de rencontre de plusieurs régions géographiques qui viennent apporter chacune un terroir, une culture et des styles architecturaux différents. Le patrimoine urbain et les espaces de nature ont un rôle structurant dans le document d'urbanisme de la métropole de Lyon. 
C'est ce que je vais vous présenter aujourd'hui pour répondre à la thématique réutilisation, adaptation et régénération des territoires et des patrimoines urbains. Je propose de vous présenter l'exemple du plan d'urbanisme de la métropole de Lyon. Celui-ci développe l'intégration des valeurs du patrimoine urbain et la préservation des espaces de nature, végétaux et aquatiques, dans les processus de développement urbain. Il apporte les réponses de la métropole aux questions où, comment et jusqu'où développer le territoire, comment l'adapter. Lors de l'importante révision de 2019, la métropole de Lyon a renforcé la prise en compte de son patrimoine naturel et de son patrimoine urbain pour répondre aux quatre orientations qu'elle se fixait. Défi métropolitain, défi économique, défi de la solidarité et de l'habitat, défi environnemental et du cadre de vie. Le défi métropolitain est de faire du centre le cœur d'une métropole rayonnante et compétitive et de préparer les conditions pour les projets d'envergure de demain qui se déploieront aux portes du centre. Le défi métropolitain est de faire du centre le cœur d'une métropole rayonnante et compétitive et de préparer les conditions pour les projets d'envergure de demain et de garantir un développement diversifié des activités au service de la ville et des habitants. Le défi de la solidarité de l'habitat est de prévoir une offre conséquente, équilibrée et solidaire de logements en neuf et en réhabilitation à destination de tous les publics et d'organiser le développement urbain mixte et résidentiel autour des transports collectifs. Enfin, le défi environnemental et du cadre de vie est de faire du centre un lieu de vie agréable à vivre et respectueux de la singularité des quartiers, de développer un centre accessible et agréable pour tous offrant des espaces de nature. Dans ce cadre, le patrimoine urbain et les espaces de nature ont été considérés selon trois axes. Le premier, le patrimoine urbain est un vecteur d'attractivité. Il s'agit d'amplifier le rayonnement patrimonial du cœur de l'agglomération. Vous voyez ici la restauration qui a eu lieu ces dernières années de l'Hôtel Dieu, qui est le, le plus grand monument historique de Lyon et un des, une des plus grandes réhabilitations au niveau de la France. Donc, le patrimoine urbain, renforcer son, patri, son rayonnement patrimonial, euh, premièrement en valorisant le patrimoine emblématique de la métropole, principalement le cœur historique de Lyon inscrit au patrimoine mondial de l'UNESCO, mais à travers le patrimoine emblématique du XXe siècle, le patrimoine de l'architecte Tony Garnier, avec les cités des États-Unis et de Gerland. Le deuxième point, en poursuivant des projets de reconversion remarquables, dans une dynamique de réinterprétation contemporaine et de mise en valeur, à l'instar des anciennes prisons de Lyon, euh, où ici le projet que vous voyez euh, de reconversion d'anciens immeubles industriels. Deuxième point pour cette, ce vecteur d'activité, donner un second souffle aux espaces publics de la presqu'île. Le deuxième axe est le patrimoine urbain comme outil de développement et d'adaptation qualitative du cadre de vie. Il participe à faire de la ville un lieu agréable et respectueux de la singularité des quartiers. La recherche de densité s'appuiera sur les qualités existantes des quartiers en respectant toute leur diversité et leurs identités, éléments de patrimoine bâti et paysager, qualité végétale, euh, les cours d'eau qui sont également très présents, qu'on voit sur la diapositive, hein, caractéristiques également spécifiques selon les périodes et les typologies patrimoniales des quartiers. Donc, en vue de préserver les quartiers les plus singuliers, laisser toute sa place à la création urbaine et architecturale, porter une attention particulière sur l'insertion harmonieuse des nouvelles constructions, extensions ou surélévations dans le tissu urbain existant. Le troisième axe seront les axes, les espaces de nature sont le socle de l'identité du, du territoire et un atout pour son développement et son adaptation. Sur la métropole de Lyon, l'approche des trames vertes et bleues est développée à partir des années 90. Couvant près de la moitié du territoire grand lyonnais, elles sont constituées d'espaces formant un réseau jusqu'au cœur de la ville dense. On voit ici sur cette diapositive. L'élément commun à tous ces lieux très différents est leur caractère végétal et ou aquatique dominant. Celui-ci est autant un héritage, un véritable don de la géographie, que le fruit de la volonté de préserver un cadre de vie équilibré. Proximité de la nature, espace de récréation, de respiration, service écosystémique, mais également une ressource. La ressource, c'est l'eau, bien sûr, la biodiversité, l'alimentation. 
Le territoire dispose ainsi d'espaces naturels encore vastes, favorisant un cadre de vie urbain de qualité et abritant des écosystèmes et une biodiversité essentielle. Cette continuité constitue une trame à dominante végétale et aquatique, complémentaire de la trame urbaine. Elle est le socle du paysage de la métropole. Alors, quels outils, pour, quels outils pour supporter cette gestion du patrimoine urbain des espaces de nature Donc, Sans répondre littéralement à la définition du paysage urbain historique définie par l'UNESCO dans sa recommandation de 2010, la métropole de Lyon intègre une conception propre. Celle-ci repose d'une part sur une approche du centre historique patrimonial de la ville comme un laboratoire pour le développement d'outils qualitatifs pour l'adaptation et le développement de la ville contemporaine dans son ensemble et d'autre part sur une approche géographique et paysagère de son territoire liée à ses fortes spécificités. Pour intégrer ces valeurs et les rendre opérationnelles, le document d'urbanisme est basé sur des éléments de connaissances thématiques. Il fixe des objectifs de protection et des règles équilibrées d'évolution. Les, les cinq outils suivants ont été développés. En premier, en premier lieu, les plans verts et bleus de l'agglomération. Ces dernières années, leur approche a évolué sur deux aspects. D'une part, l'attention de plus en plus grande portée à la biodiversité a entraîné une reconnaissance progressive du rôle d'écosystème des espaces. D'autre part, la place de l'eau y est plus affirmée, mieux connue. Ces évolutions ont contribué à conforter le rôle fondamental que joue cette trame dans l'organisation et la vie des territoires, tant pour ses qualités paysagères et récréatives qu'écologiques et nourricières. Donc vous voyez sur la diapositive cette trame verte et puis les grands parcs et les cours d'eau qui couvrent ici le territoire de la ville de Lyon. L'affirmation de ces rôles et qualités impacte nécessairement la réflexion sur la manière de la préserver, la valoriser, la faire vivre en rapport et au sein des territoires urbanisés. Les connaissances de plus en plus fines permettent d'identifier et de qualifier les espaces concernés, de définir une protection, une gestion et une mise en valeur plus adaptée selon la sensibilité des sites et l'échelle à laquelle est déclinée la trame verte et bleue. En effet, celle-ci ne se limite pas aux frontières du territoire grand lyonnais, mais s'inscrivent dans le prolongement des grandes entités naturelles, ce qui justifie d'autant plus la nécessité d'agir localement pour la préservation et l'amélioration de cette fonction. Le plan vert s'appuie notamment sur la préservation des boisements et espaces de nature, la création des continuités vertes, l'ouverture de cheminements verts, la mise en place d'espaces de pleine terre dans les nouveaux projets. Vous avez ici une vision vraiment du, de l'hypercentre historique de Lyon, avec toujours les cours d'eau, et puis ce qu'on appelle les balmes, qui sont ces grands espaces boisés qui couvrent les parties les plus pentues des collines. Le deuxième outil repose sur des formes urbaines calées sur une analyse typomorphologique du bâti existant. Pour répondre à ces objectifs économiques en matière d'habitat et de développement soutenable, la communauté urbaine a développé une approche de ces tissus urbains existants ou en recommersion par leurs connaissances et leurs qualités pour adapter la ville à ces enjeux contemporains. Une approche basée sur une analyse typomorphologique des tissus urbains sur leurs qualités paysagères et patrimoniales a permis de trouver et intégrer les espaces et modes de densification de la ville, permettant de répondre à ces besoins d'extension et d'adaptation. Dans, dans ce cadre, les qualités paysagères, architecturales et urbaines recensées ont permis d'impulser un développement qualitatif de la ville, basé sur la préservation et la mise en valeur de ces éléments, agissant comme des repères et des moteurs de cette qualité. Donc vous voyez ici les éléments d'analyse, donc typomorphologie des tissus et puis qualité des territoires sur cette diapositive. Le troisième outil permet la protection des éléments bâtis patrimoniaux et des périmètres d'intérêt patrimonial. Donc au-delà d'un patrimoine remarquable, au-delà d'un patrimoine remarquable, je n'avais pas passé la diapositive. Euh, Reconnu et préservé par différents outils relevant de l'État ou des collectivités, se développe un patrimoine plus discret dit ordinaire. Souvent méconnu, sa disparition laisse pourtant des séquelles et de son absence néamante. Patrimoine plus commun, attaché au quotidien, 
Il est le témoignage de l'histoire d'un territoire, de son développement et de sa transformation. L'enjeu de sa révélation est donc primordial, d'autant qu'il souffre d'une grande fragilité due à son caractère ordinaire, mais également à la pression de contextes urbains en forte mutation. À ce titre, le PLUA joue un rôle de transmission d'un héritage à intégrer dans la construction de la ville de demain. Donc vous voyez ici le renforcement des éléments, ce qu'on appelle les éléments patrimoniaux, qui sont plutôt des éléments architecturaux, et puis les périmètres d'intérêt qui sont des, des secteurs d'intérêt, euh, des quartiers d'intérêt patrimonial ou des ensembles paysagers d'intérêt patrimonial. Donc vous avez ici la fiche descriptive d'un élément bâti patrimonial avec des prescriptions de conservation. Dans ces périmètres, les collectivités souhaitent sensibiliser toute intervention au respect de l'identité des quartiers pour promouvoir une stratification du paysage urbain, tout en conciliant innovation, créativité et respect de la ville existante. Les périmètres d'intérêt patrimonial sont à la fois une règle et des outils d'information et de dialogue entre la collectivité et les porteurs de projets, fondés non seulement sur la règle, mais aussi une recherche qualitative à partir d'une connaissance partagée. Chacun de ces éléments fait l'objet d'une fille d'identification. Celle-ci précise les caractéristiques essentielles qui font l'intérêt patrimonial de ces ensembles. Elle comporte également des prescriptions qui visent à guider tout projet pour concourir à mettre en valeur et révéler les caractéristiques patrimoniales de l'ensemble identifié. Donc ici, vous avez l'ensemble d'un quartier qui a été revitalisé à partir d'une approche architecturale basée sur le des anciens entrepôts qui y existaient. Le quatrième axe, c'est l'orientation d'aménagement et de programmation du périmètre UNESCO qui l'apporte sur le périmètre UNESCO lui-même. Donc, Le site inscrit sur l'église du patrimoine mondial a vu sa protection et sa prise en compte largement réaffirmée lors de cette révision. Cette prise en compte apportée sur le bien lui-même ainsi que sur sa zone tampon L'ensemble représente une superficie de 750 hectares. Cet outil a pour fonction d'avoir une approche urbaine et paysagère à l'échelle de l'ensemble du périmètre. Précédemment, celui-ci était abordé au niveau de chacun des six arrondissements. L'OAP, à partir d'un diagnostic, représente, repré, euh, recense les témoins de chaque époque de construction de la ville et formule des préconisations pour les évolutions à venir. Ces prescriptions sont données en prenant en compte le paysage à toutes les échelles pour les espaces extérieurs d'une part et pour les édifices d'autre part. Ce document a une vocation généraliste et de mise en cohérence. Il est détaillé par les sites patrimoniaux remarquables qui traitent les différents ensembles urbains avec leurs particularités, Vieux Lyon, Renaissance, Quartier Canu, Presqu'île. Le cinquième axe est le paysage urbain historique de Lyon. En complément de ces actions de planification et réglementaire, la ville avec la métropole a développé un atlas historique qui donne une définition à partir des approches diachroniques et synchroniques du paysage urbain historique de la ville. Vous voyez ici l'approche diachronique à partir des cartes de l'évolution sur dix périodes différentes et significatives. Cette approche a montré la puissance de cette démarche pour la connaissance du territoire, la reconnaissance de ses qualités et la mise en place de procédures de gestion adaptées. Il devrait être enrichi dans le futur de l'histoire des espaces naturels de la métropole, de la prise en compte du patrimoine du XXe siècle et de la perception et de la connaissance de ses, de ses habitants et de ses usagers. Je terminerai euh, en ouvrant sur euh, demain, sur le futur. Demain, quelle évolution de cette démarche et de ces outils La nouvelle municipalité, élue en juin de l'année dernière, a annoncé de nouvelles évolutions dans la façon de gérer la ville. Celles-ci sont en cours d'intégration et devraient porter sur les grands objectifs et orientations suivants. Développer une ville inspirante plutôt qu'une ville attractive. Euh, nous, faisons, nous faisons ici... Euh, un clin d'œil au fait de traiter d'une ville qui soit attractive, inspirante pour ses habitants, plutôt qu'une ville qui soit muséifiée et qui est pour faire du tourisme de masse. Le deuxième point est de faire de la transition écologique le premier enjeu de la transformation de la ville. Le troisième point serait de préserver, de mettre en valeur le patrimoine comme une ressource non renouvelable et un point de convergence avec la transition écologique. 
Et le quatrième point serait de développer une ville multipolaire plutôt que verticale. Afin de poursuivre ces objectifs, afin de poursuivre ces objectifs ont été annoncés dans le domaine de son patrimoine urbain, l'étude de la révision et de l'extension de ces sites patrimoniaux remarquables, notamment du Vieux Lyon, axés sur l'adaptation et la transition écologique de ces quartiers, ainsi que l'adoption d'un nouveau plan de gestion de son site inscrit sur la liste du patrimoine mondial. Voilà, j'espère avoir été dans les temps et remercie à nouveau les organisateurs pour l'intérêt de cette journée très intéressante. Merci. Merci beaucoup, M. Lamy, pour cette présentation. It was very informative. Thank you very much. Um, I will now like to invite uh, Uh, it's my great pleasure to invite Mr. Papa Abdullah uh, Sai, Global Lead Urban Development Islamic uh, Development Bank, who will be speaking to us on the Islamic Development Bank financing for urban cultural heritage uh, with a case study of the Muharraq uh, Perling Heritage Conservation and Urban Economic Revival Project in Bahrain. Um, Mr. Abdullah Sai, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting us today uh, as well. I would like to share my screen. Oui, vous pouvez parler en français. Nous avons les traductions, donc uh, comme vous voulez. My, my, uh, my presentation is in English, so uh, I think I, I will uh, I will uh, uh, make a presentation in English. That's okay with you. Absolutely. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Let me put it in slide. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, and again, a great thanks for inviting us to this uh, uh, workshop about living with world heritage. Now, our presentation and case study is about the Moharak Perling Heritage Conservation and Urban uh, Economic Revival that was financed by the Islamic Development Bank in, uh, in, uh, in Bahrain, in the Kingdom of Bahrain. So, the Moharak, uh, to talk about the background, Moharak, the former capital is an island city in Bahrain and that uh, still preserves an authentic urban settlement which dates back uh, to the uh, Perling era uh, in the early 90s. Uh, given its historical value, Maharaj is supposed to be and to remain a key point of attraction for tourism and a vibrant economic center. Now, uh, due to the new city, which is Manama, and uh, lack of investment, the city has been characterized recently with old and dilapidated buildings. Uh, and uh, uh, through many of them, uh, uh, though many of them are of great historic value, uh, so uh, uh, making it difficult for urban mobility. Now in 2013, the government of Bahrain through the Ministry of Culture, they call it uh, Baha, Bahrain Authority for Culture and Antiquities, requested the support of the, the ISDB to develop a Perling Path project that aimed to preserve heritage assets of the city, which, is, uh, which has been listed as uh, part of uh, UNESCO heritage, and to improve livability, mobility, and uh, at the same time, problem economic and population. So uh, that, that uh, bank approved this, uh, this, this request, and uh, we started working on this project. So very quickly, the project overview, uh, it, the objective was really uh, under the concept of development through culture. Uh, the project aims at fostering social, economic and cultural development of Moharak and improving the living conditions for the residents by preserving heritage assets, developing new commercial services, attracting tourism and by improving the urban mobility. In terms of scope, uh, it's about basically rehabilitating and develop, uh, promoting the conservation of 15 historic buildings, including in, uh, included in the UNESCO World Heritage List and uh, connect them uh, through a 3.5 kilometer long uh, walk, uh, walking trail, what they call the Perling Path. In addition, 12 private properties of significant historic value shall also be conserved and rehabilitated. Also, in construction of 19 open public uh, space, uh, four parking lots, facade upgrading for uh, 750 houses, and uh, an important uh, visitor center and the original uh, pedestrian bridge. 
In terms of cost, the total project cost was estimated about uh, 70 million US dollars, and the bank provided a financing of about 40 million, uh, while the government covered the remaining cost. Now, uh, the project implementation was basically in three phases. The first one was about the design, the evaluation, the procurement, and then uh, finally monitoring and uh, evaluation. Uh, Originally, the project scope consisted of several, uh, civil, uh, seven uh, civil works components. First, the South Muharraq Conservation, the North uh, Conservation, a pathway of public, uh, a pathway and public space, pedestrian bridge, the visitor center, the multi-story parking, and then uh, the facade uh, upgrading. Now, in terms of design, uh, architectural uh, design, uh, detailed design was done in parallel with the tendering process. Uh, preparation and evaluation of tender documents were uh, also carried out. In terms of procurement, procurement process of several lots, witness cancellation and the, uh, the launching of the tender. I will come back to that about uh, during the lesson learned. And then in terms of monitoring and evaluation, ongoing monitoring and evaluation uh, was done, compared plan schedule, and a final evaluation is planned at project completion. I have to mention the project is still uh, ongoing. Some parts of the project is, uh, are still on, ongoing. Uh, these are just few uh, photos showing, for instance, the house conservation at the time uh, before the beginning of the project and uh, at the uh, onset of the project. Uh, also, we can see other photos here in terms of uh, conservation. Uh, another one here. So these are uh, photos showing really uh, at we, uh, the stage at which the uh, uh, the, the some part of the old capital city were before the beginning of the, the, the this, this project. These are all the uh, north conservation, and uh, we can see some. Uh, these are the rehabilitation uh, of the pedestrian uh, pedestrian bridge I talked about. Uh, again, we can see a uh, few photos of the pedestrian bridge once it has been rehabilitated. The commercial gallery and the hall uh, after rehabilitation. Again, few photos here. The pathway and public spaces that was designed. Now, uh, key, key challenges. What are the key challenges uh, that we face in uh, the uh, Moharak uh, pearling heritage conservation and urban uh, economic uh, renewal? Uh, uh, although this project has not been completed, we can share a few lessons learned, I think, uh, regarding the, the project implementation. In terms of uh, securing uh, owner's approval, the challenge at the initial, uh, at the onset of the project uh, was to secure approval from property owners uh, to, uh, to, to get their buildings rehabilitated under the project terms and conditions. To overcome this, pro uh, this the project pro uh, provided community awareness program and collaborated with local community to get their willingness to participate in the project. So the, uh, the, the, the ownership and the, 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 the willingness of the, the locals to participate is very important. Uh, lack of capacity expertise. It was uh, also challenging to find uh, experienced contractors in heritage building conservation, heavy procurement activities. Uh, the executive agency, BACA, faced several challenges when undertaking procurement activities. And uh, this has also uh, some impact in the, uh, time, uh, the timing and the implementation uh, schedule. A key lesson learned from the bank side uh, in terms of urban planning at the macro level and local economy. Uh, project in conservation of heritage buildings should consider urban planning at the macro level and the community settlement and local economy at the micro level. This is to ensure integration with current and future innovations and urban development, and that the project brings sustainable value to the communities. In terms of private sector involvement, private sector is critical to for sustainable development of the local economy. As such, a uh, project in heritage conservation should create opportunities for private sector involvement in terms of bringing uh, financing, and also should embed uh, this element in the project design at the early stage. Now, in terms of uh, proper work and uh, design and uh, planning, it should have been better if uh, the architectural uh, design and technical studies were finalized for launching this. And uh, this could have uh, avoided uh, delays in the tendering and relaunching uh, some of these uh, lots as well. 
a uh, few other lessons learned in terms of solid coordination arrangement is essential. Having a project coordination arrangement which brings together the different ministries, uh, department and agencies, and other key stakeholders throughout the implementation provides a forum for project oversight, guidance, regular meetings, cross-sectoral coordination, and a forum for addressing emerging challenges. We found that also that solid implementation arrangements are essential. Uh, the lack of dedicated procurement and project financial management specialists within the local project team pointed out clearly that institutional readiness is key for this type of project. Also, strong field supervision from the public authority or the executive agency and the financial team is essential in managing the delays in project implementation and minimizing cost overruns that uh, affect project financial and economic uh, returns. Now, uh, the effective community engagement. An effective community engagement process throughout all phases of the project, which brings all the key stakeholders and private sector is important, is an important ingredient which empowers the community and brings a sense of ownership and ensures sustainability. We found also that inclusion of a communication specialist in the team is essential because the omission of the communication specialist in the project team was a missed opportunity. And uh, it is critical for, uh, to have these specialists for, for effective stakeholder engagement, creating project awareness through strategic messaging, uh, effective communication and sharing project information, managing a stakeholder expectation, and also mitigating sometimes negative press and misinformation. Uh, in terms of the private sector involvement, uh, the private sector involvement is critical, as I said before, for sustainable development of the local economy. A such project in heritage conservation should create opportunities for private sector involvement, and uh, this element should be embedded right at the onset at, at the design stage. Now, a few other lessons learned and recommendations in general. Uh, the installation of, of better street light has uh, increased uh, people mobility and extension of business time. And therefore, local residents' revenue increased recreational uh, activities and the overall security of this uh, area. Uh, the anticipating and mitigating consequence of natural hazards like flooding or fire in local households and communities could hamper social economic welfare for the targeted people if it's not well addressed. Uh, in terms of uh, functional monitoring and evaluation, the timely disbursement of funds compliance to fiduciary management and competence in the procurement process are key for this type of project and to ensure a successful implementation. Having an inadequate capacity and skills of the consultant to develop good design and technical drawings, as well as carrying out the surveys that provide accurate information and inform a implementable work plan, if it's overlooked, can be detrimental to the overall project. In terms of the uh, enhancement of our own source revenue collection for the municipality hosting the part of the city, this will be really uh, something that needs to be discussed because the project investment can occur with such pro uh, can uh, can occur and is very important uh, for the municipality as well. Government willingness to allocate special funds for carrying out emergency preservation works for the most fragile houses uh, to be restored first using emergency teams of builders, architects, and uh, engineers to stop or prevent the collapse of physical structures on the residents from the inside and outside of these individual dwellings is very important to limit the risk and secure residents uh, buying. And another recommendation is that there should be appropriate fiscal incentives and financial mechanisms to promote private uh, investment to accompany the stakeholders of the project. Thank you. This is one thing I want to share with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Abdullah. This was an extremely informative, very rich, and very concise way that you've shared with us uh, the lessons learned from your uh, several years of work on this, uh, this project. So this is uh, very, very uh, important for us. Thank you. Um, uh, we have now the final case study for today's uh, session is uh, from the Agence Française de Développement. We have uh, Ms. Fatima Shuk, uh, responsable d'équipe projet Division Développement Arba, 
a management, logement des gens français de développement. We're delighted to have you with us. Uh, a very big welcome. And you will be talking about urban projects and restoration of heritage. Thank you very much. Uh, le micro, uh, peut-être uh, couper le micro. Okay, Madame bon. Chuk, vous m'entendez? Ah oui. Bonjour. Donc, Bonjour. Je suis Fatima Chiu, que je représente l'Agence française de développement. Et je vais surtout vous parler, moi, de la stratégie, de l'approche de l'AFD en matière d'intervention sur, sur le patrimoine. On évoquera assez rapidement le cas du Liban. Je dis rapidement parce que ce n'est pas moi qui suis en charge de ce projet. Je devais intervenir sur la Tunisie, mais je crois qu'hier, vous avez eu beaucoup de sujets sur la Tunisie. Je cherchais ma présentation, hein, qui est une présentation euh, assez succincte. Euh, je ne sais pas si vous ne la voyez pas encore. Euh, je vais partager. Euh, oui, que... oui, oui, allez-y. C'est bon, vous la voyez Alors, Attendez. Pas encore. Ah non, pas encore. Mais euh, alors, si je fais ça et que je reviens. Attendez. Écran. Si je fais ça. Oui. Attendez, je regarde si c'est la bonne présentation. Oui. Donc euh, voilà. Donc euh, je ne vais pas resituer euh, l'Agence française de développement. Je crois qu'ils ont l'agence a l'habitude d'intervenir euh, dans les séances de l'Union pour la Méditerranée. C'est une agence qui a été créée en 1941 et qui a une tradition d'intervention euh, dans le développement urbain en particulier. Euh, euh, que vous dire, c'est que l'AFD euh, 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 intervient traditionnellement dans le développement urbain et que sa stratégie euh, dans l'intervention euh, dans les quartiers anciens de patrimoine ou de, de patrimoine remarquable va permettre une déclinaison de ces orientations stratégiques en matière de développement urbain euh, des villes. Le premier de ces objectifs, c'est l'amélioration de la qualité de vie des habitants qui doivent être les premiers bénéficiaires de ces interventions. Cela passe par le renforcement des services de base, eau, assainissement, gestion des déchets. Et à chaque fois qu'on va intervenir sur des projets comme ça, on va veiller à ce que les, services, à ce que les habitants puissent bénéficier de ces services de base. On a aussi un objectif de réduction de l'impact environnemental et sanitaire, notamment des déchets solide en ville, le développement de l'accès au logement, le soutien à l'emploi et le développement local en particulier, en veillant à l'intégration des petits opérateurs. Euh, voilà. Le deuxième objectif stratégique hein, de, de la ville durable, c'est la promotion, le développement durable des territoires, en particulier en soutenant le renouvellement des centres-villes et la mise en valeur du patrimoine qui doit être un facteur d'attractivité des territoires. Le renforcement des locaux et euh, le troisième objectif, c'est le renforcement des acteurs locaux en charge de la ville, c'est-à-dire que apporter euh, toutes les assistances techniques les appuis nécessaires qui permettent d'améliorer les performances des collectivités et de leurs cadres, un appui aussi à la décentralisation puisque on inscrit notre action dans le territoire et avec l'ensemble des acteurs, donc euh, à l'échelle nationale, euh, notre, on cherche aussi à intervenir de manière plus locale avec euh, les collectivités, en premier lieu les, les communes. Et donc il y a un enjeu euh, d'appuyer euh, certains pays à la décentralisation et au développement des, euh, des capacités aussi financières euh, des collectivités, puisque euh, il faut développer la capacité des collectivités à agir à la fois sur le plan technique, mais aussi sur le plan financier. Donc voilà comment ça se traduit du coup en termes de stratégie de patrimoine. L'AFD soutient la protection et la, la sauvegarde 
du Sprat Trimoine, parce qu'effectivement, on pense que ça doit contribuer à l'attractivité urbaine, à la création d'emplois, et parce que aussi euh, ces, ces projets euh, ont un fort euh, un impact euh, euh, social et un fort potentiel de développement d'un socle d'identité collective. Donc, euh, L'action de l'AFD et de nos partenaires consiste à concilier la conservation des quartiers, l'attractivité des territoires et le développement à long terme. Et on va véritablement euh, s'inscrire dans, euh, dans une démarche euh, de développement intégré. Donc euh, voilà, enfin là on a un schéma qui décrit un peu les trois axes, hein, nos interventions, on a quand même un objectif de réduire les impacts euh, sociaux, notamment euh, des interventions sur le patrimoine, puisque dès lors qu'on va intervenir sur des sites anciens ou sur euh, du patrimoine, hein, qu'il s'agisse euh, de bâtiments publics ou de, ou de bâtiments habités et de logements, on va créer euh, de la valorisation euh, foncière et, et du coup on a véritablement un risque pour les populations qui sont les plus défavorisés de se trouver exclus de ce développement-là. Donc, on a quand même un enjeu de mieux maîtriser, de, enfin, de maîtrise des risques de muséification, par exemple, de spéculation immobilière et de, et de gentrification. Et on va toujours, dans les projets sur lesquels on va intervenir, favoriser euh, la, euh, la prise en compte de la mixité des fonctions. On ne va pas avoir juste une entrée patrimoniale. Ce que je dis, c'est vraiment un projet intégré euh, en euh, veillant à la mixité à la fois des fonctions et à la mixité euh, sociale et surtout euh, de préserver les usages existants quitte à les améliorer et à garantir euh, et ça passe aussi par euh, notamment dès lors qu'on intervient sur du patrimoine euh, bâti, garantir euh, le logement pour tous en favorisant euh, quand c'est possible des financements pour maintenir une, la population euh, locale sur le site. Donc, euh, ce schéma-là montre que la protection du patrimoine tel que l'AFD la finance combine aussi bien euh, des investissements et des activités dans trois domaines, la protection et la réhabilitation du patrimoine public, qui inclut des travaux proprement dits, mais aussi l'élaboration de plans de protection, la conception muséographique et, scéno et scénographique. Et compte tenu des risques techniques, on va voir que ces projets mobilisent énormément d'acteurs spécialisés dans le patrimoine, l'archéologie ou certaines techniques de construction. Et là, on va faire aussi appel pour mener ces projets à la palette quand même d'entreprises ou enfin à l'expertise française qui est très riche en la matière. On a aussi un enjeu de développement économique euh, local et la mise en valeur touristique hein, qui inclut euh, l'appui à, à, à des filières liées au patrimoine et au tourisme, euh, comme les techniques de construction traditionnelles, l'élaboration de stratégies de positionnement touristique ou encore l'amélioration euh, des accès à des sites patrimoniaux. Donc, on va vraiment travailler sur tout l'environnement, euh, qu'il euh, qu s'agisse de l'amélioration des espaces publics, de créer des circuits euh, touristiques et pas uniquement sur, sur l'aspect patrimoine. Et on est toujours dans un objectif d'amélioration du cadre de vie dans les zones patrimoniales et dans l'environnement afin que la requalification euh, urbaine bénéficie euh, à l'ensemble euh, des, euh, des habitants. Euh, Excusez-moi. Et enfin, euh, on a, euh, au-delà de ces grands, trois grands axes, on, a, on peut dire qu'on a un axe transversal euh, que j'avais introduit tout à l'heure, qui est le renforcement des capacités euh, euh, des acteurs, euh, qu'il qu s'agisse des autorités nationales ou locales tout, euh, comme de la population, puisqu'on favorise la concertation et l'inclusion des habitants. Et, euh, et donc, euh, il y a effectivement la question de la forte dimension identitaire du patrimoine, l'implication euh, qui, euh, qui nécessite d'impliquer les habitants, les usagers euh, dans le montage de projets. Donc, euh, à la fois, on est euh, sur un projet intégré au sens technique, mais aussi euh, social, puisqu'on va favoriser euh, le, euh, le travail des, des acteurs, qu'il s'agisse de la société civile, des usagers, des commerçants, avec euh, les autorités locales. Il y a tout un travail sur effectivement euh, euh, enfin, tout un, un, tout, des compétences techniques qui sont sollicitées euh, sur la gouvernance des musées, la valorisation des sites, la conservation et la restauration euh, archéologique. Donc euh, voilà, c'était euh, 
Euh, donc, euh, on, là, ce, cette, ce slide-là rappelle un peu les, les principales, enfin, nos principales clés d'intervention. Hein. On est euh, toujours euh, dans un objectif de développement économique, d'accompagner euh, les sites euh, les plus, plus fragiles, euh, favoriser le renouvellement urbain, euh, notamment euh, dans les villes secondaires, enfin, euh, pour euh, éviter à la fois la, la, congestion, la congestion des villes, mais, euh, et de réutiliser euh, le foncier existant plutôt que d'être sur de, de l'extension. Et donc, euh, l'objectif est aussi d'ancrer la restauration euh, dans un projet de, de, urbain intégré et de, et de long terme. Et surtout, euh, la, 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 troisième la cinquième condition, c'est aussi de, de s'assurer euh, de... Euh, euh, enfin de limiter les, euh, les impacts euh, sociaux, notamment les impacts sociaux négatifs qui pourraient conduire, si on n'est pas vigilant, à l'exclusion euh, des habitants qui vivaient initialement sur le site. Euh, voilà, donc euh, on a l'exemple dont on peut parler, hein, c'est... Euh, c'est le Liban où on intervient sur des villes de secondaires. On avait deux phases de projet. C'est un projet qui a commencé en 2010. La première phase était à 62 millions d'euros et aujourd'hui la phase 2 est à 36 millions d'euros. On sait un confinancement AFD, le gouvernement italien et la Banque mondiale. Pardon. Donc, euh, la, fin la finalité euh, du projet euh, est de contribuer au développement économique hein, tout en renforçant la cohésion sociale des villes de Tyr et de Tripoli. Les objectifs spécifiques sont de promouvoir le développement d'une activité touristique à, à Tyr et Tripoli, favoriser l'appropriation euh, par les habitants du patrimoine culturel, améliorer le cadre de vie dans les quartiers historiques euh, paupérisés. Et on, on, en fait, sur ce projet, au départ, c'est que la préservation des monuments historiques et des sites archéologiques n'était pas l'objectif premier. Euh, les opérations qui ont été conduites, euh, voilà, il y avait surtout un objectif euh, social à la base. Hein. On connaît le contexte et c'est vrai que la protection du patrimoine n'était pas euh, en soi... Euh, l'objectif, la finalité euh, du projet, mais c'était vraiment effectivement euh, s'assurer euh, euh, à la fois de créer, d'avoir des, des impacts sociaux importants et d'avoir euh, un développement territorial euh, grâce à ces projets de patrimoine. Voilà. Donc... Euh, à Tripoli, ce qui a été réalisé, c'est la construction d'une plateforme sur le fleuve Abou Ali et la valorisation de la citadelle Saint-Gilles, du, du port de pêche de, de Tyr. Et à Tyr, on a la dynamisation des activités commerciales et la stimulation du tourisme côtier via la rénovation du port de pêche, la réhabilitation euh, de, la, de la zone côtière. Euh, voilà, je ne sais pas ce que... C'est vrai que je suis désolée, mais les... je suis... Sur ces projets-là, je ne les, connais... les connais pas en détail. Mais euh, dire que dans nos interventions, c'est effectivement euh, profiter euh, de, euh, de l'enjeu patrimonial pour, in... pour intervenir sur une palette d'éléments euh, urbains euh, qui permettent à la fois euh, de créer euh, du développement économique et la cohésion des territoires et d'avoir un effet euh, très positif euh, sur les habitants. Je ne sais pas si vous avez des, des questions. Merci beaucoup, Madame Chuk. Uh, are you at the end of your presentation? Vous êtes terminé? Euh, oui, oui j'ai enfin, euh, terminé. Je ne sais pas sur le, sur le Liban si vous avez euh, des questions, mais. Euh, yes. En, en yes, fait, c'était peut-être. We will si... open up for questions and discussions in just a few minutes. We have a discussion, mm -hmm. and then after that, we have questions for all the speakers at the same time. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, this was uh, very rich and lots of uh, very important points. Um, I'm going to request now Ms. Elizabeth Vines uh, from ECOMOS, uh, in, who's joining us from Australia, um, to, to, uh, to please give your thoughts, uh, share with us your reflections on these presentations very quickly, and then open up the floor for some discussion. And then I will join you for the final closing. Thank you very much. Okay, what a, what a rich couple of hours that we've had. Uh, incredible. And what has been highlighted to me that this year is the 10th anniversary of the Hull recommendation, which several of the presenters have outlined their familiarity with and support for this recommendation. I think there are so many great examples of the principles and recommendations outlined in the Hull uh, process. Um, but the other thing that really struck me as very relevant was that what we've seen is, is local responses to the urgent timeframes of the STGs. Um, as a practicing architect myself, I feel that these goals, the 17 goals, we've only got nine years to, prove, to achieve these, address these goals by 2030 which have very broad coverage, as you would all know. But I think what we've seen tonight, or tonight for me, morning for you, um, is how local communities are responding to these goals, not just goal 11, which we are all familiar with this about sustainable cities and communities, but the general goals of good health and well-being, strong institutions, partnerships, clean water, economic growth, industry and innovation. I've just found these um, presentations really inspiring and I do hope there's going to be some way of, of looking at these PowerPoints afterwards. And if I just go quickly through some of the points made, I mean, Karen's first presentation with the case study of Girona and then Aguas Mort um, was very inspirational, looking at how leftover landscape spaces, formerly seen as leftover spaces, um, could particularly during the COVID, difficult COVID year that, and ongoing COVID um, conditions that we have, there's opportunities for these spaces to be brought alive and to be activated by locals. And I found that was a very important contribution. And of course, wouldn't we love to come to your Granada conference <laughs> in October? Um, Thomas, fantastic to hear from you as a fellow architect. And I also was pleased to see, of course, the Sydney Opera House, your, the involvement of your organisation in competitions and so forth, but also your support for the Hull um, aims and processes. And I thought that uh, something that I will now look up is how the UIA has, in fact, addressed the SDGs. And I'll, I'm, I'm particularly involved um, and keep using these as a, a kind of a framework for as a professional to be trying to achieve. Um, and I've, I've found uh, the, the input from you talking about the pressures, the mass tourism, uh, which of course now disappeared, but of course they might be back post COVID and the negative influences that have, has had on um, heritage. Um, thank you, Hamdan, nice to see you. As you know, I'm very familiar with Georgetown and what an impressive coverage of how you are making Georgetown much more livable with placemaking emphasis, not just conservation of buildings, incredible investment, government commitment to this place. And also how Georgetown is has become, as you said, an icon for um, creating um, benchmark projects and processes for other areas in Malaysia. Um, one of the things that that uh, your organization, of course, has been very responsible about is um, building expertise, about training and, and about being generous with your examples and your successes and your challenges. And I thought that your reflections, your both positive and negative reflections, um, and your comments about the challenges of COVID uh, were, were very, very relevant to us all. Um, Emphasising we can't be haphazard with our planning, that we do rely on partnerships, pilot initiatives, and also the traditional principles of conservation. 
Um, Philippe, nice to hear you again. I've heard your presentation before on uh, Leon, but picking up new um, in influences in inputs that you've had, um, focusing on a very comprehensive approach to planning, very much following you know, the Hull model of, of all these um, different interrelationships, um, again, case studies, different neighbourhoods, historic buildings carefully mapped. And I loved your conclusion about wanting an inspiring city, not just an attractive city, um, and your obvious very careful management plans. Now, I did find the financing um, sector um, and focusing on Bahrain wonderful and uh, very much built on what we heard yesterday from the European Investment Bank. Um, and I've not been to Bahrain and I'm not familiar with that part of the world, but I thought the comprehensiveness again of how you have done an extraordinary amount of work within a short time frame, 2014 to now, gosh, we're talking seven years uh, with this allocation of resources, but also the outcomes. And uh, Jyoti mentioned this before, the lessons that you learned, I think I would really love uh, copies of those slides because I think they're good checklists of what you do and what you don't do. Um, your very, very tight time frame really um, meant that you learnt things that you missed out on. Um, you mentioned inadequate capacity of consultants. You mentioned the need for better stakeholder engagement. Um, mitigating negative press. I thought that was just so relevant. Um, misinformation about projects. That, that can be so difficult to manage. And then finally, Fatima. Um, thank you for the very interesting comprehensive coverage of what the Engence Francais de Development is up to. Uh, again, emphasizing the strengthening of local stakeholders and reflecting after 20 years of operation in Lebanon, uh, Tripoli and Sur. Very hard to quickly summarize. But I think my overall thing is just this delight in seeing Hull in, operational, in operation and the SDGs being addressed in such a uh, responsible manner by these um, various case studies. Now, um, what we're going to move into now, and I might need to be guided on how to find these questions, is, is to have the opportunity for uh, people to discuss what we've been um, talking about in, in this session. Um, I, I will be giving you the opportunity to raise your hands, uh, make comments or write these questions in the chat. And then I would like to coordinate responses from the various speakers that we've had. So if you've got specific questions of specific speakers, uh, please ask these. Uh, it is in your chat uh, so far, nothing in the, the chat questions and um, any raised hands about any questions to all the rich material, um, the incredibly comprehensive presentations. Or indeed, if we've got nothing from the participants, whether any of the contributors might like to participate in a cross discussion between uh, some of the presentations. I don't. Thank, thank you, uh, Liz. I might uh, jump in here just to help um, prompt some questions and some discussion uh, while we wait for others to to raise their hand or put a note in the chat. Uh, I, I was I was really interested to uh, hear uh, that there were very many different perspectives talking about social inclusion and the need for strengthening the community coming from uh, from uh, from Fatima Shuk to uh, the uh, emphasis on uh, more on the exterior of the city on the landscape which was something that both Karin and uh, Hamdan talked about. Um, but I really was interested in seeing how we engage with the buildings, because there was also the idea that there's uh, shop houses, for example, which are financed, you know, things like that. How does the balance between the inside and the outside, how is that decision being made? Uh, this is open to any of the participants and any of the uh, the speakers in terms of what they see as a way to make that decision. How do you decide the balance of how much and what's good? 
I think if I can just volunteer to just uh, kickstart the conversation, uh, the approach that we took in Georgetown was one where we said that um, at the minimum, uh, we need to actually ensure the external facade uh, is to is protected and uh, and and uh, to what do you call you are able to keep the look and feel or what it was before, and part of the grants program that we incentivized was actually to encourage at the minimum to get the private owners particularly to given in Georgetown nearly 90, 80 to eighty five percent of the properties are held by the private sector. We took an approach where we incentivized the private sector to actually kickstart the restoration by considering to bring back their historical facades. And, and, and we contributed some capital so that it's a co-investment with them. Now, by getting them started in that journey, it encourages them to reflect on the uniqueness of their buildings and also then encourages them to think about now how can they maybe go ahead and do a bigger conservation work to their, to their assets. And that, that process of deciding in terms of how much gets done outside and inside that's, it's going to be a consideration based on the complexity of the project as well as the capacity, financial capacity of the, of the what do you call, owners of the assets and so on. Now, for those who are more well endowed, like the example that you showed about the seven terraces, the, while the facade looks very uniform from outside, the internal is actually very extensive. In fact, you know, uh, it's probably one of the more extensive uh, boutique type of of a hotel that has been uh, that has adopted uh, has been a very successful adaptive adaptive use project uh, reference because you know the site was totally burned down prior to that um, and where we see the investor has actually invested quite a bit both in terms of how ornate the whole completion of the project but at the same time there are many residents in Georgetown who are of of medium capacity or lower capacity so we encourage them to make their places uh, to, to uh, what we call in terms of more livable by relooking in terms of using design and architectural interventions so that the places where they live becomes places where they can actually make it to become not only a house but rather a home and probably even a hub for them to actually both live and work. Uh, thank you, Hamdana. I, I would like to continue this discussion that we've got about um, and building conservation um, and um, ask Mr. Abdul Asai about, um, he mentioned um, in his very good summary about the lessons learned that one of the key challenges was lack of capacity and expertise, um, finding suitable contractors, um, finding suitable consultants, that there were limitations in this sort of expertise. And I was just wondering whether over this seven year period, um, which as I've said before, is a very fast period to have undertaken what you've undertaken, um, whether you now have access to much better um, expertise and capacity, which is now making the whole process of ongoing um, regeneration, rehabilitation, conservation, a lot easier. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Wine, uh, for this uh, question. Uh, it's a very interesting question. First of all, I would like to say that some part of the, this project uh, are still ongoing. It's not all completed yet, but overall, uh, as you mentioned, and I think some of my colleagues, uh, my panelists also mentioned, uh, uh, I mean, uh, restoring some, uh, some of these uh, assets can be very complicated because it's a part of manual works that uh, craftsmen are, are doing. And you need to find the right expertise, the right skill. And at the onset of the project, it's not obvious that the designer, the consultant, they can assess how much work is needed to rehabilitate, to restore this piece of uh, asset or to, 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 to restore this monument. So this is a sort of a financial estimate of the, uh, the, the, that can be really very tricky at the beginning. And that's where sometimes the, 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 uh, the, the, the consultant would really need to work with people that know restoration, historic restoration of buildings, how much time it takes to do the restoration and how fine, how accurate, would you like to go back to the, uh, uh, let's say, to the original uh, original display to, 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 to really to, to, to mimic the original display? So these are issues that are very tricky. And sometimes when it's not really uh, fully assessed at the onset of the design, it uh, can be, uh, it can delay the project, but also it can uh, create some cost overrun. 
uh, uh, now uh, in Bahrain, uh, they, 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 there were few craftsmen that were able to do the restoration, but not uh, all the, that we did it for this project. So we had to find other people that can come and do uh, really the restoration. And this is time consuming because the contractor will have really to bring these people, we'll have to find the contracts and so on and so forth. So I think the, the, the most complicated uh, phase is the initial phase, uh, the conception, the, uh, the design phase, uh, ensuring that all that is needed to, 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 to reach the, uh, the, the uh, completion is taken into account in terms of expertise, in terms of the amount of work needed, but in terms of the, the financial means. Uh, I think that uh, when this is done and also taking into account not uh, having a team, you talked about having a team, a, a coordination of different departments, because there are lots of things involved sometimes. You have services that are need to be taken into account. You have also other things that really need to, the, the end users, the people that live in the area. We need also to take into account that the desiderata is very important. So having this all coordination can be very time consuming. And at the same time, we want to complete this project because a project is defined by time. So we have to complete it as soon as possible. But managing all these, uh, these, these issues can be very tricky, we found. Mm. Thank you. And so far, still no um, audience chat question. So I, I would like to drill down a little bit further with um, any of the speakers who'd like to respond to the challenges that we currently have in our cities related, of course, to COVID. Um, there's been discussions about that, that there is not in the Mediterranean now the number of tourists that there were. Um, in the Australian context, the response to COVID has been to accelerate development because this is generates jobs. And I just wondered, which in a sense, in, in our context, uh, we don't have world heritage cities we're talking about, but we do have a very um, consistent inner city areas. And there is a development almost at any cost mentality to generate jobs um, post COVID. Um, I just wondered whether any other participants in this challenge that we're in is pressured by these from, from their cities, for example, in Lyon, whether there's this problem of the economic imperative, in a sense, conflicting uh, with the careful conservation and urban regeneration objectives, um, re retaining the OUVs that we've been talking about. Any comments from any of the participants on, on that issue? I'd like to make a comment that's related. Um, I think that one of the uh, byproducts of the pandemic has been uh, a greater public appreciation for the cities in which they live and the amenities that are possible in a city when you reduce the amount of automobile traffic, when you have a reduction in the pernicious effects of tourism, and when you are striving to find time out of doors in environments that are healthful and, and give enjoyment. I think there has been a very good side to this uh, for cities and for the infrastructure of cities. We see pressure in Paris, for example, to uh, increase the amount of space available for bicycles, to renew the uh, investments in public space and gardens and places where people can recreate outdoors easily without a great investment of time and effort to move from one place to another. And I think that pattern has been uh, repeated uh, all over the globe. I, I know that for the first time uh, in the experience of many people who are um, age 20 or younger, um, they are really seeing their city for the first time in a way that is uh, positive and, and beneficial. That doesn't uh, take away from all of the difficulties or the uh, negative consequences of the pandemic on businesses, particularly on small enterprises, on uh, restaurants, cafes, and other service industries. But I think it does underscore uh, the, the potential that cities have to be good places for people to live. And even in the restaurant industry, Paris is now poised to reopen partially tomorrow for the first time in almost uh, more than a year, uh, some of the restaurants and cafes. And they've given over a great deal of space recently uh, 
taken up by automobiles uh, for use by restaurants and uh, cafes as seating areas. This is a good thing, and this is something that will endure. And uh, I, I understand your comment about the pressures uh, to, to have shovel-ready projects and, and things that will create jobs. Uh, but I think some of the positive side of that will be jobs and investments in uh, amenities and infrastructure that really works for people who live in cities and is not simply make work more roads, more bridges, more highways and that sort of thing, but in fact investments in what matters to people at the ground level. Thank you. Very, very, very relevant comments. Uh, Philippe, did you want to add to that? Yeah, Liz, I think there are also a couple uh, of uh, raised hands. Je veux oh, bien intervenir okay. pour la ville de Lyon. Oui, je partage totalement les conclusions de Monsieur Vaudier, bien sûr, sur les grandes villes. Que ce que nous avons constaté à Lyon, on, ben, on remarque bien un, un peu l'effet d'électrochoc que, le, que cette pandémie a eu par rapport à nos sociétés. Il y a beaucoup de choses qu'on ne croyait pas possibles et qui finalement, tout d'un coup, le sont. Voilà. Euh, et puis, euh, je voulais insister sur effectivement la question de la biodiversité, du besoin de campagne, de la densité aussi de nos villes qui a été interrogée par la pandémie euh, avec les possibilités de sortir ou non. Et puis, en ce qui concerne la, la partie, disons, plus sociale et économique, en France, nous, c'est un problème qui est sans doute, qui pour le moment n'est pas très apparent parce que les mesures financières, disons, et fiscales ont reporté un peu ce problème et il risque d'arriver dès la, dès la fin de la pandémie avec toutes ces questions-là, et y compris l'impact qu'on pourrait avoir sur le, les jeunes générations qui ont pu être très traumatisées de toute cette, de toute cette année avec la difficulté de poursuivre les études, la difficulté de, de vie en société. Donc, je pense que ça sera aussi un, un sujet pour les, pour les années qui viennent. Euh, notre adjoint nous décrivait un peu les choses de la façon suivante. Il nous disait, euh, sur les années qui viennent, on, a, on gère cette crise de la, la pandémie de, de santé. Euh, dans les mois qui vont venir et dans les années qui vont venir, on va, créer, on va gérer une crise sociale, on va rattraper tout ce, ce retard économique. Et puis, euh, tout ça nous renvoie vers la, la troisième crise ce n'est pas très positif hein, ce que je dis, mais bon, c'est un peu la, la réalité à laquelle il faut s'affronter. La troisième crise qui est bien sûr celle du changement climatique euh, qui arrive juste à venir puisqu'on commence à se rendre compte de tous les impacts que cette crise peut avoir sur nos, sur nos activités quotidiennes. Voilà quelques éléments d'appréciation de, de vue de notre ville de Lyon. Thank you very much and I apologize two raised hands, but I would now like to mark You're muted now, Liz. Can you unmute yourself, please? I beg your pardon. Um, I'm sorry that uh, there, there are in fact two raised hands. Mr. Saeed from Tunisia, uh, are you able to pose your question? I don't have a question written. Would you like to speak your question? Or if uh, we also have a raised hand from Guido Licciardo, are you able to post your question? They haven't been written, but Sorry? Yes? Uh, who, who is speaking now? Um, oui, merci. Oui, merci. Euh, euh, je voudrais avant tout vous remercier euh, pour cette euh, réunion et pour ce débat et pour euh, ces présentations. Je, je remercie tous mes collègues architectes et amis euh, qui ont présenté euh, ces, ces, les, les documents qu'on a vus tout à l'heure et leur expérience. Euh, je voulais par ailleurs remercier euh, l'Union des architectes internationales parce qu'il a mis le doigt directement sur le rôle de l'architecte de patrimoine au niveau de la, de la gestion du de patrimoine des villes historiques, parce qu'aujourd'hui, si on souffre, on souffre d'une bonne gestion liée au bâtiment, liée à l'urbanisation, liée à, à l'espace, à, à la qualité d'espace dans lequel on vit. Euh, aussi bien quand on parle 
la relation entre l'urbain et, et la pandémie euh, COVID-19, on voit très bien aujourd'hui qu'il y a un exode rural qui est revenu vers les, 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 les villes historiques, tout en euh, envahissant les rues avec des petits euh, commerces qui n'ont pas été euh, prévus par les, 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 les gestionnaires. On voit aussi la fermeture des, des, des artisanats aujourd'hui qui sont le, 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 le moteur de, de, économique qui, qui, qui est dans les, les rues et les, les voiries des, des, des tissus urbains, comme je suis le gestionnaire de, de la Médina de Sousse à Tunis, à, à, en Tunisie. Euh, je vois ça très clair aujourd'hui. La pandémie a un retombé économique euh, sur, euh, le, sur la, la Médina de Sousse qu'on qu le voit chaque jour et en train de s'enfoncer, de s'agrandir. Euh, Aujourd'hui, on circule dans des rues vides, comme si c'était euh, une ville des, des, des gosses. Des, euh, voilà. Euh, ma question aujourd'hui, est-ce que l'architecte de patrimoine, c'est le premier gestionnaire qui doit un, intervenir sur le patrimoine des, euh, des villes historiques C'est lui qui va améliorer la qualité de ses tissus, qu'il doit conserver, qu'il doit sauvegarder en collaboration avec les différents profils qui, qui l'entourent, les chercheurs, les archéologues, pour donner un produit qui respecte, les, 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 qui respecte la, les aspects de la comme de UV. Euh, Excusez-moi, le mot m'a échappé. Euh, les, 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 les valeurs exceptionnelles, universelles, voilà, je vais chercher ça. Qui, qui, et tout ça, c'est le rôle de l'architecte. Est-ce que l'architecte aujourd'hui, il existe vraiment dans la gestion de toutes ces, ces, ces villes classées patrimoine mondial ou non est-ce que son rôle aujourd'hui, il est le rôle numéro un sur la gestion ou il est secondaire Parce qu'on voit aujourd'hui dans beaucoup d'autres villes méditerranéennes, je dis bien, que l'architecte n'a pas un rôle, euh, euh, qui, qui est un rôle qui chapote l'équipe, un rôle qui, qui, lui, qui est porteur de projet. On le voit toujours comme un, un, un second lieu, même en, 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 en troisième ligne, pour donner un appui de, 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 architectural à la recherche et à la gestion et la sauvegarde. Voilà, c'est ma question qui, qui concerne l'architecte de patrimoine dans la conservation et la, et la sauvegarde des, des, des villes historiques. Merci. Thank you. I think I think we won't actually answer that question. I, I do apologize because we are running out of time. But in a sense, you are challenging us as architects in our role now, particularly in relation to the post pandemic current po and post pandemic situation. But we did have another raised hand from uh, Mr. Lichiabdi. Guido, are you able to articulate a question or a quick comment? Hello, Elizabeth, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Okay. No, very briefly, actually, Guido Licciardi from, uh, from UNESCO, from, from the World Bank, I'm sorry. I would like to congratulate UNESCO, actually, more than a question, it's sharing a reflection. I think that I truly appreciated, actually, the case studies that were presented because they were very much an implementation of the historic urban landscape approach. And I, I hope, actually, that we can continue the discussion on how to address COVID COVID-19 challenges. And this is something we've been reflecting a lot, actually, on our side at the World Bank, also with the countries we've been working with. Uh, personally, I believe that COVID-19 is an opportunity to go beyond the linkage that we had seen in recent years, the linkage between heritage and past tourism, which generated employment opportunities, but also a lot of negative impacts in many of the world heritage sites in which we work. I mean, what we call over tourism. I'm calling you now from Florence, my hometown, which is a typical example of uh, of that uh, pendulum that went far beyond actually the limit of sustainability. Uh, I think also looking at macro data that tourism will not resume in the same numbers in the short and mid term. 
And so I believe that us as professionals working on heritage have the responsibility of uh, identifying measures that can give an economic future to places and sites and cities that were living so much out of that mass tourism that to a certain extent was also damaging those sites. Uh, I believe actually that you know the way forward is about a combination of three elements. One, the economic sector that does not require consumers to travel to destinations, which is what we call creative industries, handicraft, even virtual tourism, or everything that actually can generate an economic flow without people moving, which is the prerequisite of tourism, is something that can still work during the pandemic and will also be perhaps more sustainable and resilient for the conservation of those sites. Second, Definitely, we are going to have sustainable and low impact tourism, but in my view, we have to advise countries and sites on how to rethink their model, how to be slower, how to spend time in locations rather than traveling from one to the other, you know, coming in Rome, sleeping in Florence and then waking up the next day in Venice. And third, an economic dimension, which for me is important, is also the urban regeneration one, the one that generates benefits for local communities. That, you know, before the pandemic, with the pressure of fast developing tourism, not many people were listening to. But nowadays, with the need of identifying quick spending sectors, also for economic, economic recovery packages, urban regeneration is something that, in my view, we can focus on a lot, because there are money that governments will make available for the economy to recover. And doing all those small scale civil works, which are typical of conservation and urban regeneration, is something that we can advocate for because of the immediate economic impacts for local communities and also the improvement to their living conditions. Uh, sorry again if I took so much time, but I, I wanted again to congratulate UNESCO for this excellent workshop. And uh, it was really pleasant to spend these two days together despite you know being far away from each other. Thank you. Uh, look, thank you for that contribution. I found those three points very, very helpful. And I think we're all realizing, um, certainly for me in Australia, you know, I'm not leaving my country. Um, I'm within my country. We are now all appreciating our own countries because of this change in the way that we're leading our lives. I think those three points were a great way to, we, we do have, uh, we are now 20 minutes over the anticipated completion, but I'm so pleased that there's been um, that contribution. Um, I'd also like to um, make a note of the message which Karen has put up on our internal chat here saying, in relation to climate change, emphasizing the role that landscape architects have in relation to skills to address climate change issues. And I think that uh, certainly her presentation at the beginning of, of this morning's sessions out, outlined the sensitivities that, and skills that landscape architects um, have in 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 those in in that issue, um, Jyoti, would you think the time frame is such now for wrapping up? Um, yes, I think uh, we can certainly wrap up. Maybe we can just uh, ask around if there's one last comment or one last question uh, that anybody would like to pose uh, or any burning uh, reflection. Otherwise, we can just move to to pull together some of the points. I think right. um, one, one last comment, maybe just for reflection, I think just to emphasize that there, there is a great need uh, for creating a, what I call a coalition to engage governments that there is needs to be a, a more systematic way how uh, investing into culture and cultural assets needs to be done. Uh, and there's enough evidence that exists whereby what do you call that uh, the cultural assets uh, are, are, are clear, clear drivers or economic catalysts that generates large spillover effects to the local economy and you know, creates new types of jobs and services and so on. A lot of times, uh, culture and, and cultural assets are seen to be nice to have uh, and not seen to be a mainstream agenda. But I think there's enough demonstration over the last three decades uh, or since the 80s, that, 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 that what they call the approach of how historical assets, historical landscapes have become a key catalyst about how people consume uh, and benefit from uh, the, the, what they call the regeneration and rehabilitation of these assets has become an important impetus 
that serves not only for the purposes of supporting the local economy, but rather it becomes a, 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 an important driver. And I said earlier, like in the case of Penang, Georgetown, um, cult, the whole listing of the World Heritage Site has become a, a, a single factor that has been an impetus that has repositioned Penang as a, a cultural heritage tourism site. So in this regard, uh, I'm just opening up this to the audience uh, who are here in the in, in the session today to say that we would be working uh, with partners around the world to create that kind of coalition and that I would like to invite all of you all to join us uh, and we hope to have a, a, a global seminar that eventually that can become a policy paper that can be taken up with each or individual government to showcase how cultural assets uh, have become an important part of the, the what I would call a, a economic agenda of the future. Thank you very much. And I, I would like to add to that too, that I personally, I feel the COVID context that we now live in has allowed for much greater equity of access to information around the world. And this, this uh, program, this two hour discussion um, is typical of what we are now able to experience. That is the exchange of ideas, showcasing projects, sharing challenges and uh, so Hamdan I would really support this this idea about engagement that you're talking about I have personally learned a lot from yesterday and today uh, and I'd like to thank not having been a speaker myself but to thank the speakers it's been a fantastically rich contribution um, and uh, of all, also of course um, uh, UNESCO uh, and the other organizers the um, I uh, UFM uh, it's just been a wonderful exchange of ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz, and all, all the participants. As a way to sort of pull together, uh, you know, there's been such a lot of a very, very rich exchange. Um, I, I wanted to just reflect on a few points so that we have something to take away. And we'll build on these and uh, share them with the speakers. But I want to to just bring together some of the key points that we have uh, been listening to um, and, and see if you have uh, any further reflections on them. So first, uh, I think uh, most important is the importance of the whole recommendation um, approach uh, that is seen as key to adaptive reuse and regeneration. I think that this was something that was that came through very clearly uh, in, in all of the, the discussions uh, in one way or the other. Second is that regeneration and adaptive reuse must be a planned effort, not a um, you know, haphazard or fragmented piecemeal approach. And this, and there are many reasons for this, and I think this came through in different ways, but I, th I just want to keep that up there because it seemed like a very important point. Related to this is the fact that a, an overall assessment is very key, which is to say that we need a thoroughly prepared assessment of the entire heritage property um, and management plan, as well as the city development plan to identify very clearly what are the key uh, heritage values, what is the outstanding universal value? Are there other local attributes that must be retained? Um, and therefore, decide what must be retained and what could possibly change. This is a very critical piece of the analysis, it seems to me, looking at some of the examples where they, you know, in different uh, case studies, they're talking about keeping the street front but changing the inside. But there may be other situations where the courtyard plan is so important that the insides are as important as the street front. So these decisions or the volumes, these are decisions that have to be made at the planning stage. And this is where the assessment and the planning, a planned effort at regeneration adaptive use have to happen together, it seems to me. The next point has to do with an integrated urban regeneration effort, which is to say that different aspects of city and government departments, such as infrastructure, housing, economic development, jobs creation, all have to work together. So it's not in tourism, of course, 
So it's not just about any one sector benefiting. And so this integrated urban regeneration, again, is something that we will come back to, but seemed very key. Um, then if we have to undertake a, a more integrated approach, then it also requires a governance structures that promote such an integrated interdisciplinary approach, because in general, municipal governments, as many other governments, tend to work in a siloed way. And I think that what we're hearing from everybody is the importance of somehow breaking the silos and working across sectors, across disciplines. Um, furthermore, uh, we must look at urban regeneration and cultural projects to improve environmental sustainability and promote sustainable development. I think the relationships to the SDGs, to climate change, climate action, to ecological objectives, uh, to looking at uh, the, uh, the, the circular economy, these are different ways in which the idea of uh, minimizing waste, using local resources, and, and demonstrating environmental sustainability has been reinforced. Public spaces uh, is the next point I want to talk about, not only because it was one of the important points mentioned in the chat uh, by Karin, but also because uh, it's uh, something that I think uh, was brought up also yesterday in, in by the EIB, where they were saying they actually see it as valuable to invest in public spaces, which I think is uh, incredible that they're not only looking at buildings, but seeing public spaces as important to bringing people together, to connections. And so, and, and what we've heard from different speakers is not only looking at public spaces inside the city, but also outside the city, connections to the surrounding spaces, uh, to uh, connecting between buildings, enhancing pedestrian streets and walkability, and, um, and looking at leftover spaces to make them uh, more community oriented. Um, the next point has to do with uh, focus away from mass tourism, not focusing only on mass tourism, but looking, especially in the in the situation of the of the COVID uh, sanitary crisis, looking at uh, high quality uh, tourism or uh, you know very selective longer stay tourism sort of reimagining tourism which is also you know sustainable tourism is something that unesco has developed a lot of guidance on looking at regenerative tourism is another way to look at this idea of how tourism itself can contribute to regenerating local economies and uh, looking at alternatives to tourism as uh, guido uh, liciardi has just been telling us um we can also look at, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and when I say uh, looking at alternatives to tourism, it's really a focus on local communities and local economic and social development, as, as was pointed out. Uh, so the local people and stakeholders need to be engaged. And this was clear from the points that were made about importance of community awareness, a sense of ownership that everybody uh, needs to have for the projects to go forward and succeed. The use of local and traditional building technologies and materials came up a number of times. Um, uh, the importance of local infrastructure from lighting and safety to other uh, sorts of, you know, just basic water supply, sanitation infrastructure. Um, I think the point about local well-being, that local communities need to feel and need to have their lives improved. So, and and uh, urgence francaise, the, the urgence francaise, the developer emphasized a number of times. Um, as um, Fatima Ashuk uh, spoke repeatedly about not removing local people, not removing people because they are poor and in living in a place, but finding ways of keeping them there, finding ways of integrating them into uh, the regeneration plan. So this kind of positive social impact uh, was also something that, and it wasn't only uh, her, there were others who spoke about different ways in which enhancing social inclusion, affordability and positive social impact was seen as something very, very um, 
uh, critical. Monitoring and evaluation, of course, and we're looking at it again in the framework of, of sustainable development. But most of all, the need for a systematic approach to culture, which is something I think that uh, we, it was among our closing remarks that we heard. So these are some of the points um, that we would uh, like to, to take away from here, uh, as well as the, uh, the emphasis on the, 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 the current times, uh, the COVID-19 crisis has, has put and made us realize on digital education and marketing being able to exchange and build capacities uh, through digital means. And I think a point that was very interesting that was also uh, left, you know, made by several, especially of the, of the uh, uh, development agencies and banks has been that it takes time. These projects don't happen overnight. And so to not expect to see the results overnight, which I think is a really important point that these are long projects um you know the uh, the bahrain project we, we learned was seven years and still not yet done uh, agence francaise de développement fatima Sheikh talked about long-term projects i think these are really that's very important to hear that these are because these are very multi uh, you know georgetown you talked about being 12 years and still continuing and we hear this over and over so having that kind of a long-term commitment also means that we're making sort of developing a vision so as as um as Lyon um as Mr Lamy said you're not just developing an attractive city you're developing a vision for a city that you want the city to be so these are I think very very rich and important points that at least uh you know, tried to cull together from, from everything that uh, we've been hearing and, and, and all the points raised. We'll send these to you written up, uh, at least to the speakers, uh, to, to hear back from you your thoughts and if there's any additions or modifications uh, to these. Um, and, and at the moment, I just want to give one minute for anybody to, to come back to comment on the points raised. Thank you very, very much. And a big thank you to the UFM for organizing. It's been such a pleasure to work with you. It's a wonderful partnership that we greatly value. I know that I say uh, is here with us, the deputy um, representative of, of the uh, of the UFM, uh, the deputy secretary general. Please, uh, if you want to say a couple of words uh, to to conclude, also. Well, uh, I think that it was a uh, it was a very fruitful meeting, and we are grateful uh, to the UNESCO World Heritage Center and uh, to you, especially uh, as its uh, deputy director, and to all the panelists for this meeting. Please also take into account that uh, we have developed uh, action plans, uh, a strategic action plan and the housing action plan, which takes uh, all of these issues and the challenges into account. It will soon be published, so I hope that you will have time to have a look at it. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, and thank you very much, and, uh, and goodbye, and we'll be in touch with you shortly. Thank you.